Using cell and gene therapy, we can make your penis larger. It's called clone hair stem cells, effectively cure baldness. There's a lot of benefits to the plasma gene therapy. The first one we did was called folostatin. Not only does it inhibit myostatin, so it increases lean body mass, it's super anti-catabolic. Even the people who weren't exercising, some of them increase their lean body mass. And the folostatin increases bone density as well. Our how? Well, how? <laughs> I've done it for NFL guys too. WADA can't test for it, and there's been no adverse effects. Gene-edited embryos are a real thing now. It just, it opens on Pandora's box. It could elevate an individual's testosterone, but they are producing that on their own. We put the gene in for testosterone. It's literally a subcutaneous injection. Even if you have severe dementia, you can usually take them back a stage. So oh. if you have severe, you can go to moderate. If you have moderate, you can go mild. If you have mild, you can go back basically being normal. We can treat autism and cerebral palsy. Anything uh, new or different with like peptides? And that's a mitochondrial peptide. I've had NHL athletes who said it changed their whole game. They're not going to take off because they're not patentable. They made it clear that they do not care about people. They don't care about health. They care about profits. How do we, where do we get this? It was like this uh, bacon fat or like, where, what do we got to do? Well, <laughs> as a regenerative medicine doctor, my thing is always looking at the latest technology. <laughs> and so one of the things we can do using cell and gene therapy is we can make your penis larger. Wow. So why would people be seeking that out? <laughs> I, I don't know. I thought. <laughs> uh, so the interesting thing is, has been so the gene therapy has been done in mice. So it's it's actually a myostatin inhibitor as well, but it's specifically in the penis. So it can make it about f at least fourteen percent larger based off the animal studies. Flaccid or. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys getting these mice? Erect mice? <laughs> yeah, I just want you guys to have a mental image of an erect mouse right now. <laughs> like, uh, like mice, mice are getting so fucked over all the time, but these lucky mice end up packing some serious heat, right? Like a lot of times, mice are getting like whacked on the head. Yeah. They're doing all this crazy shit to them, starving them. Tumors everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. We're, these we're, guys, all of a we're making mice are getting lined up. Like me next. Yeah. 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 Oh. We're making the world a better place. Let's one, go. One mouse penis at a time. Mm. But the fat graft is actually a procedure that's been done for breast augmentation as well. It's where you actually just harvest your own fat. Mm -hmm. And then that fatty... Harvest your mm -hmm. own fat. Yeah. I love the sound. <laughs> <laughs> but it's pretty cool because the fatty tissue has, it has some stem cells in there, but you can use it as a scaffold and you can seed it with actual stem cells. And what they'll do is they'll actually make whatever organ or tissue you're injecting larger. So you've probably heard of women getting stuff done in their cheeks to make their cheeks bigger. That's yeah. like fat graft. So a lot of times, because that's permanent, unlike fillers, which are just, you know, there for six months or whatever, and they dissolve. Wow. So you can do that for breasts, but you can also do that for penis now. Jeez. And we have a urologist who does that specifically for that. So with it being fat, if you drop down to like 5% body fat, will <laughs> it start to pull from those areas that you got <laughs> the fat injected into? No. So the fat, once it's injected, it responds to the local signals. So it actually turns into the local tissue. So it's actually going to turn into normal Yo, breast tissue right. or normal penis tissue. <laughs> <laughs> but as you said, John Cena just faints. Yeah. <laughs> like my dick needs to go on a diet. <laughs> Got too much fat in it. <laughs> so I mean, us? okay, I know we're laughing at this, but it's actually it's, it, it's something that does you know it. There you're doing it, but it's going to be really popular if it works. Well. My question: Do you guys ever end up with people with like misshapen dicks? It, it, actually, we use it to treat Peroni's disease, which is a condition where you get like fibrotic tissue, and so that disease actually gets curvature of the penis. So we can actually use the stem cells and the fat graft to fix it. Mm -hmm. So it's the opposite. Yeah, it's actually great. It can be, and I mean, this is actually very important because if you're a guy and your dick is curved, you can't do what you want to do with women, right? You do, you, you, like, it sucks. And yeah, some different guys, angles, maybe? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and you're, creative. And you're kind, of, you're kind of, like, you literally can't, you can't do anything in terms of, like, you know, sexual practices. For, and I've had guys for, like, a couple years, and it, it really affects their life. So it can be pretty restorative. <sighs> this is actually pretty dope, because have you guys heard about, I don't know if you guys heard about those, like, nightmare surgeries that guys have been getting to mm. increase, oh, like, no. they'll get implant stuff, yeah. right? Oof. And then I've seen some pictures, and it's just like, ooh. <sighs> I don't Terrific. know why you would put silicone in your dick, but oh. if you, <laughs> but men yeah. do it, yeah. Probably I, I, not a good idea. No, and we know after the breast uh, illness syndrome, which, which happens to so many women after breast augmentation, putting silicone in your body is not a good idea. So mm -hmm. we've got a lot of other stuff to get to, but let's stay no. on the dick for a little <laughs> yeah. bit longer here. <laughs> is there anything else uh, new or exciting about penis health? I think we the biggest thing we're understanding is just like heart health. It's about blood flow. So mm -hmm. if you don't have enough blood flow to the penis, it's not going to work as well as you want. And erectile dysfunction is becoming more and more common in younger people. 
So all these young guys are popping Viagra and Cialis. But it's like, dude, what's the root problem? It's because you're freaking eating potato chips and not exercising. Yeah. Mm. So that's the really the big root of all of it, potato right? Potato chips, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to get your lifestyle optimized. And a lot of times you can fix the blood flow issue. But if you still can't, then the stem cell injections will fix and increase blood flow. And they'll actually help to break up fibrosis and plaques as well. Mm. So they can be restorative for that. What about like how much is how much is something like that gonna set you back, Doc? Because I'm just curious. Because that shit's probably I'm curious. Yeah, the very guy curious. with the biggest dick on the podcast. I is curious. say that. Nope. Okay. Not, well, I'm he and it's Congolese. <laughs> he has like two percent Congolese in his 23 and me. So <laughs> yeah, well, that's I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> me neither. It's not where I want to start. It's uh, it's like ten thousand US. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do it in Los Cabos, Mexico, and because uh, we used expanded stem cells, which are cultured and grown in a lab, mm-hmm. and then. We inject them in. We gotta raise those prices up. We can't have everybody <laughs> walking around. <laughs> Dude, you know what's even cooler? But this is what every man's gonna want. And maybe maybe you'll want it. It's uh <laughs> Did you just point at me? I'm talking about the other thing guys care about the most, which is their hair. Because uh, Keith was funny, I mean <laughs> I have a hat on, but you know. <laughs> so we can genetically reprogram stem cells mm-hmm. and then we can grow hair follicles. So it's called it's called clone hair stem cells. So basically we could take one hair follicle from the back of your scalp mm-hmm. and we could grow it in a lab and we can grow how many hair follicles as we want. We can grow ten thousand wow. hair follicles Whoa. and we can implant them one by one. So you can effectively cure baldness. Mm. Shit. Yeah. So And you really- could probably uh, at this point you can probably um, not get bald in the first place, maybe with some other therapies, right? Well, exactly. There's so many, like, because we know inflammation, DHT, like all that stuff is why people go bald. And plus yeah. there's a element of genetics, but you can't control, but mm. yeah. Who's that guy who came on the podcast and like looked at me and was like, you know, baldness, which is a genetic defect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, genetic defect. <laughs> hey, but that's real. It, it, yeah. it would hurts would you be able to <laughs> implant someone else's follicles into your hair? So like, I mean, you probably could, but then it'd be look weird. <laughs> <laughs> so you want, Why, do you, you want to have, have an afro? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking it's even like some long, long blonde locks. I'm good, Doug. Like from uh, like Terry Crews on Idiocracy. Mm. Still haven't seen the movie. Gotta watch oh, it. It's a great movie. <laughs> yeah. What's a fecal implant? Mm. Yeah, so poop pills are going to be the next wave of restoring the immune system. because oh, It's going to be great for your breath. <laughs> <laughs> They're encapsulated, double encapsulated, so it won't affect your breath. It shouldn't. And, but basically, fecal microbial transplants were initially done through colonoscopy. So they had to go through your bum, basically, to put in new bacteria. Mm-hmm. But the problem, obviously, is like, who wants to do that for every like, anti-aging longevity? Because it's an invasive procedure. Yeah. So there's a guy named Dr. Thomas Brody. He's like the OG godfather of like gastroenterology. He's from Australia. And he, uh, he started doing FMT by capsules. He figured out a method to encapsulate them so you can circumvent the problem of doing them colonoscopy, through colonoscopy. So he's, been, he's done over 12,000 cases uh, over the last 10 years, but it's super inaccessible. Like if you want to get that in the U.S., as the U.S. often does, they regulate it like a drug. And so you can't just go and get it. And even if you want it, even if you have inflammatory bowel disease, they won't let you, they, they make it very challenging. Like if I had patients who've had to take poop from their own parents and put it up their enema mm. through, on their own so they could treat their IBD. Mm. And it actually treated it. Okay. But they, the fact that they had to resort to that was just so like heartbreaking for me to hear. And I was like, what the heck? Like, well, how can you not want to help these people? So then that's why I looked into like, how can we help these people? Because so many of people with gut issues, mm. plus the gut is the root of like immune dysfunction, which is the root of so many chronic diseases, like chronic inflammation. So the FMT, the fecal microbial transplant basically helps to repopulate the gut bacteria, which play such a big role in aging and chronic disease because of the metabolites they produce. Like there's a study that just came out like this week showing that the metabolites that those gut bacteria produce can even be responsible for like liver cancer. So they made a new treatment where they're targeting specifically the microbes uh, using like microRNA to prevent those metabolites so you can treat liver cancer. Uh, it has been done in mice. But the point is, is it comes, a lot of disease comes back to the gut. Yeah. So some people can get like a treatment for irritable bowel and things like that through this. Just, exactly. You just pills for four to six months. It's like super duper probiotics. Because mm-hmm. problem with probiotics, a lot, like some of them work, some of them don't. And a lot of them don't actually stay. Like if you do studies, like a lot of those bacteria don't actually end up staying in the gut afterwards. Yeah. So it's like, what did you actually achieve? You took them mm-hmm. for a bit. Maybe they stayed there transitorily. Uh, or tr- uh, like just for a temporary amount of time. So whereas with the FMT, they're actually going to do what like have a long term benefit. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think every I think it's going to be a huge 
like it's gonna help a lot of people and like I mean I'm first on the list for that so I wanted for myself and then mm-hmm. <laughs> just because it's like I, I I've had IBS issues and I feel like a lot of people have it because of the food supply the food the supply chain right mm-hmm. and like all the processed foods we eat and stuff like that and growing up uh, we get exposed to so many toxins and pesticides and everything like that so mm-hmm. I think it's gonna it just it's just providing accessibility for people who want to get FMT through our manufacturing process. Mm. And is it your own fecal matter that's used for this? No, this? we get a super donor. So oh. <laughs> a not, super donor? Like <laughs> someone's just sitting a lot. Literally. There's just did one ever, godfather. Did you ever see that South Park episode with Tom Brady poop? <laughs> I haven't. Oh, what? what? Oh, you gotta, you, you gotta YouTube that. You gotta have to YouTube that. So oh. Tom Brady's poop is apparently the best poop in the world, according to South Park. It's a hilarious episode. Okay. But the principle is actually pretty is is actually pretty accurate, which is that if you want to take someone else's poop into your body, you want the healthiest poop. And Tom Brady's is probably pretty healthy. But sure. we, we we find we find donors. We we have our own selection process for finding donors, and but we only use one donor who has like the best poop. Essentially, how do you, okay. yeah, there's what are criteria you for? for I know there's criteria for that. <laughs> Combing like, through it, <laughs> <laughs> like man, too much corn in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> no, but I have a human microbiome. Uh, she's a she's a PhD in this, and her job is literally to she has a proprietary method on how mm-hmm. she selects the donors because uh, she looks at the ratios of the different bacteria. She looks at the health of the person, and she has a method to make sure that whatever FMT product we're using is mm-hmm. going to be the best for as many people as possible. And this is just generation one. You can, uh, over time, we're going to make FMT products for different conditions. Because we know, like, for example, even Parkinson's disease, there's a paper that came out showing that it was linked to a gut bacteria issue. Mm. Um, So, again, like, there's so many chronic neurodegenerative conditions, too, that are coming back to the gut. I got to have you meet my friend Joel Green. You guys would have a lot to discuss. He's been talking about, like, gut health type stuff forever. So I think you guys would have... A lot, a lot of cool information to share back and forth. Yeah, my, my thing is always about therapeutics because I'm like, how do I help people? So that's why I'm doing all these different manufacturing with the FMT, but also the cell and gene therapy too. Because, I mean, there's peptides like BPC that can help with gut inflammation and stuff like that. And But when you combine it with stem cells for, infl- neuro, for inflammation in the gut and then FMT, then you're really getting like amazing results because mm. you're treating all the different mechanisms that cause the issue in the first place. Mm. Yeah, let's dive into the stem cells a little bit more. Um, I think over the last several years, there's been, um, it seems to be real hit or miss. You know, people are, are like, no, it doesn't work. Then some people are like, well, you have to go to a different country. Um, you know, what are some of the differences in our stem cells uh, in, from what you're seeing? Are they working well for people? Um, more and more because there's like new technology or what's kind of going on with stem cells? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of charlatans in the space, right? They're like, stem cells will fix you everything. You just put them, you can put them here, you can do this and for this, you can cure Alzheimer's, you can do for small core injury. So there's a lot. That is the way they kind of say, say it sometimes. Like it will fix everything. You exactly. Just put it, you just, just put it in your elbow. Just put it everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you'll be good. You'll be a brand new person. And that's And that's where, even for me, I had a hard time getting into it because I thought it was so snake oil salesman like you know what i mean and there's a lot of predatory marketing where they're just using celebrity endorsements and then it's like what's the real science behind it so obviously before i got into it i started diving into the science uh, and i was lucky because i worked in the middle east and then i worked in japan and europe so i got different perspectives on like how are they actually doing stem cells and what i learned is it's really about the manufacturing process so it's like how do you grow the stem cells mm-hmm. so just like I always kind of equate it to like electric vehicle batteries. If you remember like electric vehicle batteries in 2010, if you bought a Tesla, it was a pretty bad, pretty bad car. Like it wasn't great and it didn't go very far and the battery technology wasn't very good. But over time, it got better and better. So similarly, stem cell manufacturing has got better and better over the last couple of years. So now we're at a point where we can grow them in a way which allows them to survive better and it also allows them to do their function better. Mm-hmm. And so this is called, there's gene edited stem cells where you actually edit them to do specific targeted things and help protect them from the immune system. Uh, and then you can also do something called biomaterials, which are actually, you use 3D bioprinting or hydrogels, which are like little scaffolds that basically form around the stem cells and basically protect them from your body's own immune system because the biggest problem with like IV umbilical cord stem cells and all these things is they don't stay in your body very long so a lot of people think and that's gonna, what most people do that's what most people do and okay. the problem is they're basically they're thinking they're going to regrow all these new tissue and stuff like that but really they're just signaling molecules so because they're just the stem cells send signals that help to repair and regenerate tissue mm-hmm. but they're not really engrafting So it's called paracrine signaling, where they're sending signals, but they're not engrafting into new tissue. So the hot area of research is like, hey, how do we make them actually engraft and grow new tissue? And that's where biomaterials come in and gene editing technology comes in, because we can actually get them to work better and stay in longer. Hmm. So 
for example, I think the coolest technology I learned about was in Japan. They, there's a guy named Professor Yamanaka. He got the Nobel Prize about like eight years ago uh, for basically figuring out how to take any cell in your body and reprogramming it into a naked stem cell, like an embryonic stem cell, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. It's like your body has this memory to it essentially... Like swipes it clean kind of. Literally, huh? yeah. Wow. So, it, But the fact that your body can even do that with genetic mm. reprogramming is pretty impressive. Yeah. That means your body has this innate desire or ability to heal. That's what it tells me. And so we're just trying to like, we're trying to demystify it. And so, we, but it's pretty, but basically what that does is it makes it into an embryonic stem cell. But the problem with embryonic stem cells is that they, they're too strong. They can grow into tumors. So, so they're called induced pluripotent stem cells or IPSC. But the problem with IPSC, no one can figure out like, how do we make this work clinically without causing tumors? Until this, there's a group in, in actually from Canada that, that figured out how to do a gene edited IPSC so it prevents uncontrolled proliferation. Mm. So they have clinical grade ones. So that's the technology that we're using now. Mm. And that's like the next generation technology. I call it second generation stem cells because they're gene edited and they're targeted for specific conditions. So there's like specific ones for osteoarthritis. There's specific ones for like diabetes, like islet cells that you can inject into the pancreas. Mm. There's neuroprogenitor cells that you can use for de neurodegenerative conditions. So it's getting more and more precise, right? It's precision medicine instead of just being like umbilical core stem cells for everyone. Yeah. Let me ask you this real quick about stem cells because one thing you do see is like you I've seen posts from high level grapplers going I'm not going to name specific companies but they're going to get stem cells done, right? You see it from a lot of people who get injuries. If somebody is like I want stem cells now, I'm going to go to this company, what are the questions that they should ask so they know maybe what red flags to pay attention to because I think you've mentioned there's no other company that's kind of doing what you guys are currently doing. But yeah. No, there isn't. And the problem is the doctors who are promoting it aren't typically scientists, and the people who start these companies are typically <coughs> businessmen. So, like BioAccelerator is a perfect example. It started by a businessman. So, what's the businessman going to try to do? He's going to try to promote stem cells for as much as possible. Yeah. They, don't, they don't really necessarily care about the quality uh, and the science because the science is evolving so fast. And so, the questions I would ask is what testing are you doing first of all on the stem cells in terms of like quality control mm -hmm. like are they doing something called flow cytometry which is to test and make sure that the stem cell markers are actually reflective of what the cells should be so flow cytometry is basically just like a is like a special <clears throat> assay that they do to see if the cells actually have the markers there's something called cell markers and mm -hmm. the stem cells express these certain cell markers and so the flow cytometry can just tell you that so that's one way. Yeah. Uh, and then the other way is like, what's the actual manufacturing process? This is detailed questions, but I would, the, the simplest thing you can ask is how many passages the stem cells go through. So this is when you transfer it from one flask to another. So why is that important? Because if you, if you transfer it too many flasks, like when you're growing them, then the cells can become senescent and they don't survive. Mm -hmm. And then they actually cause more inflammation and can, can actually make you worse. Yeah. So you gotta be careful where you go for stem cells. They're not always harmless, right? Uh -huh. And that's why we, we our manufacturer, we, I work with them closely on the culture medium, the expansion process, how we're doing it. So we make sure that we're not doing more than like four to six passages. But I know for a fact, a lot of the companies in South America are doing like 10 passages. And so you're gonna have higher risk of senescence and then you're gonna have higher, higher risk of having other problems with that. And of course it works for a lot of people, but just about, there are a lot of people it doesn't work for. And like, you know, Ed Cohn is a perfect example because he's talked about it openly with me and he's promoted it with me. And we, he went to Panama and it didn't work for him. He still has shoulder issues. Um, because of that. Because of that. It wasn't good quality. And it was also, it wasn't done the right way. Like the injection wasn't in the right spot. So we have, we're really good with like image guided techniques. That's kind of like our claim to fame, so to speak, was our ultrasound. We're able to find small tears. We're able to find things that even MRIs miss. And then we can do the direct injections right into there. Because uh, the stem cells do have a bit of a homing mechanism, but they're not going to magically just go everywhere and repair your, your tissue. You have to get it into the right spot. Yeah. Like there is a systemic effect if you do IV, but for like specific medical conditions like a rotator cuff tear or osteoarthritis, you really need to go into the area to get the best result. And so the biggest problem I see is the interventional aspect and then obviously the quality. So I think if you're gonna go to someone, you should figure out what their, like, what's their interventional skill set. You know, like are they actually experienced physicians doing interventional pain and spine and like all these different procedures? A lot of them aren't. And they're just, you know, and they're just kind of like getting into the stem cell world because it's a hot topic, but they don't actually know what they're doing. What uh, what's something that kind of changed your mind about it? Like uh, when you saw maybe it being utilized in the company that you're with or you started utilizing it more in, in practice, what was something where you were like, like this, this not only works, but it works way better than I ever really thought. 
It, yeah, it was when I was in Dubai. So I worked in Dubai for four months this year. And uh, it really changed my whole perspective because they've been doing it for nine years and over there there's no restrictions in terms of application of uh, expanded stem cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the people I was treating were getting better. And I treated like the royal families and like, you don't screw up with those guys because if they if you if you don't make them better or if they get infection or something goes bad like you're dead. Oh, you're literally dead. <laughs> you know, there's no there's no recourse there, right? <laughs> so you have actually a picture on your Instagram with um a little Muhammad. bit on the line. There. Yeah, Alibar. He's the richest Al man in the uh, Middle East. He's uh, he built from, them. Uh, Jordan or oh yeah, that's him. Yeah, from yeah yeah. He's from uh, no, he's from Dubai. Dubai. So he built he owns that. This guy's hilarious. So he owns that the tallest. He owns the six tallest buildings in the world, including the Burj Khalifa, which is behind us. <laughs> so he made a. He wanted to. Take, <laughs> yeah. So he wanted to take a picture, and but he wanted good lighting. So he's like. <laughs> <laughs> so he literally made a call. I'm not taking that picture. You know, like here, hold my phone. Take a picture. Oh, no, 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 no. So he literally made a call and then they do the light show for him. And the, on that building on behind that building, him. It's the world's biggest screen. And it costs, wow. guess how much it costs if you want if you're not the owner of it, if you want to display something on there. Twenty million dollars. <laughs> Fifty thousand dollars per minute. Oh wow. Whoa. That's that's, that's still that's a I lot. Can't, I can't math what 50. that would be an hour. <laughs> oh, dude, it cost him shit. <laughs> <laughs> Man owns the building. That's amazing. So that, my, that was kind of my I guess claim to fame because uh, when I treated him, he posted about it, which was really nice of him. And everyone in the Middle East knows who he is, including all the royals, because yeah. he was a guy who built Dubai. Dude, Dubai what? is a reason it is because Mohammed Alibar had the vision of saying, "I want to make Dubai the tourist hub in the world." Mm. So he made, he had the vision of the mall. He owns the mall, the Dubai Mall, the Burj Khalifa, all the big attractions, he owns them all. Yeah. And it was his vision. And he had a shoulder issue for like 20 years. And they basically the doctors there are just like, let's do cortisone. Didn't work. Uh, MRI was normal. So they're just like, okay, I guess there's nothing. Just do physio. So he's just literally been doing physio for 20 years once a week. <laughs> and so we come in there, we find, we use our ultrasound and we find two small tears and we fix it with just like PRP. It was like, it was an easy fix, but Wait, he was just so a happy. PRP injection. Yeah. And because for a lot of like tendon tears and stuff like that, PRP works great. Mm -hmm. And then his wife had a similar issue. She couldn't sleep at night for like six months. And I, I, we found some small tears in her knees that were missed on MRI, fixed it up. And now she can sleep. And he was so happy. He was more happy about his wife being able to sleep than his own issue. But it was just like, the point is like, yes. you know, it's like, why are these people seeking this out? Right. Wow. Yeah. The light show is pretty amazing. And he's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's just, I found it so hilarious that he could just make a phone call and <laughs> light my building up, dog. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, but also light my building because I need to take a selfie. <laughs> take a selfie. <laughs> That's, the best. That's so dope. <laughs> but, but, sir, it's $50,000 a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Dude. It's amazing. Oh. So, it, what makes kind of Dubai different and you were talking about Japan too yeah from the United States because like all this stuff seems amazing but it just seems like it's so hard here it, it's, it's literally illegal here like ah. FDA and I mean there are a lot of stem cell clinics but FDA still says stem cells in the US are illegal and but there's a lot of there's just so many clinics offer them but the problem is because it's illegal it becomes almost like a black market where it's like where are these people sourcing their stem cells from and is there a good mm -hmm. quality control there's usually not and so it's almost, it's, and that's why I don't understand why the FDA doesn't just create a regulatory framework like Japan and Dubai have, where it's like, hey, we're going to regulate this. You can do this, but this is the standard that we have, and mm -hmm. this is the protocols that you have to follow. That's, that's pretty simple to do because other countries have already done it. Why FDA is the way they are is because, I mean, I know they're, they're like an overprotective mother. They have, you know, in terms of like, you know, certain foods and stuff, like obviously you don't... Well, what can I say? They, they haven't done a very good job because <laughs> okay. like, I think they have good intentions, but the problem is there's lobbyists. There's a lot of people involved in the pharmaceutical world that play a role in their decision making. 70% mm -hmm. of the money, the donors that they get is actually from pharmaceutical companies. So they're obviously going to have an interest in wanting to promote that stuff more than stuff that's going to take away from that business. And I think that's just the reality of it. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's just, it's facts. And why, and then if you ask yourself, if this treatment is approved in the Middle East and Japan, which are developed countries, they're not like Colombia and like, like no offense, those are developing, you know, they're not great places to live. And, but like Japan's a flourishing economy, right? Yes. They're a really strong economy. They have strong science technology. Why is a country like that approved this for over nine years and it's not approved here? Mm. That makes you question things. So that's what when and I, when I worked in Japan and that's kind of what opened my eyes too. I was like, 
wait a minute, this can't just be because it's like, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's much, something more to this. And so I started digging and then you just go down that rabbit hole and you realize there's just people out there who are actually lobbying against stem cell approvals. And those people have ties to pharmaceutical companies. Mm-hmm. So you're working out, you're working on nutrition, you're working on your feet, you're working on your sleep, and all these things are having benefit. But what's going on underneath the hood? What's going on with your hormones? That question is answered by working with Merrick Health. It's owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. And getting your blood work done by Merrick Health will help you understand what's going on under the hood. They have different panels that you can do once every six months or every single month so you can understand how your sleep, all these different protocols that you're adding into your routine are affecting your hormones. It's important to understand and it's also important to know if what you're doing is actually working. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the checkup panel, or any individual lab that you select. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project, promo code Power Project at checkout, links in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. What can people expect uh, getting stem cells? Like, what what have you seen it uh, heal and fix? And yeah, it, it, it's. I mean, if you if you're getting good quality stem cells with the right dosing and the right protocols, they almost always work. I, I never like to say anything's 100, percent but it's like it's just like 90 to 95 percent. It's pretty high success rate. Uh, and but the protocols are important. Like we use peptides. We do other things with hyperbaric oxygen to make sure they survive and they do what they need to. So I think the pre-procedure care and the post-procedure care are very important. Uh, but the actual procedure, like the most common thing we treat are definitely chronic pain, you know, because I, I mean, opioids and, you know, that you've talked about that a lot, but people have gone down those rabbit holes where they get addicted. They, mm-hmm. And a lot of times those meds don't even work or they stop working. And then people are left with like no options. Um, and so for chronic pain, a lot of times we'll do like in, intravenous stem cells for like the whole body because like people who especially have like fibromyalgia or have pain like everywhere, it'll, it'll help to reduce the systemic inflammation. And then we'll do guided injections wherever they have structural damage. So like degenerative disc disease, like osteoarthritis, like rotator cuff tears, tears wherever, we'll find it with ultrasound or x-ray and we'll guide the needles directly into there. And those those can heal like people like people have arthritis in their wrists or certain things or, or like injuries in their back those can help heal those areas? Yeah, they're not just anti-inflammatory, they're regenerative as well. So they reduce inflammation, but they also have regenerative components, especially the next generation of stem cells. Yeah. The umbilical cord, I would say, are more anti-inflammatory, but the second gen are with the hydrogels and the gene edited stuff are mm-hmm. true regenerative, meaning they'll actually repair and regrow new tissue. Uh, so that's the, and that's the dream, right? It's like, can we take the body back to a previous state? That's yeah. basically what regenerative medicine is at mm-hmm. a very high level. It's just like, can we restore the body back to the way it was instead of cutting shit out or just putting you on drugs? Mm-hmm. And now we're getting there. Like it's getting better and better every year. And so that's going to disrupt the whole mainstream medical model because it's based off this model of, you know, reactive care and of not treating the root cause of just treating the symptoms. Mm-hmm. So, and I think my, you know, my dream with all this stuff is like one day you'll be able to go to your you know family doctor or whatever and get like IV stem cells and like the follistatin gene therapy which we'll talk about like anti-aging stuff and then imagine how much chronic disease you could prevent mm. but then that's bad for business right because yeah. <laughs> yeah. the hospitals are busy yeah. the hospitals aren't busy because people are you know there are acute traumas and stuff like that obviously that's part of it but hospitals are busy because there's so much chronic disease exasperation people have heart disease heart failure like COPD, like diabetes, all this stuff. And then they get flare ups and then they have to end up in hospitals. And that's the majority of burden of disease on society. Yeah. If people are feeling good and they feel energized and they Mm -hmm. still feel young, their joints feel good. um, Hopefully they'll move on to move around more. They'll be encouraged to move around more. Yeah. And if you slow down aging, you slow down chronic disease because aging has 10 hallmarks of like what we call fundamental principles of dysfunction. Similar to in physics, you have what are called first principles. In, in biology now, we understand we have fundamental principles that govern like the cellular dysfunction process. So you may have heard of some of them, like mitochondrial dysfunction, chronic inflammation, or what's called senescence, uh, like, in, like chronic inflammation basically in the body, mm-hmm. dysregulated nutrient sensing. There's all these different things. There's 10 of them. Uh, but the point is they underlie almost every chronic disease process. So when you look at even heart disease, what's the root of it? It's actually chronic inflammation, it's mitochondrial dysfunction, it's the same loss of proteostasis, which is like a protein turnover. It's the same, it's the same foundation. Yeah. So it's like, if we can slow down aging, and that's why a lot of people are like, oh, this aging stuff is just for rich people. It's like, maybe it is right now, but it just like plasma TVs used to be $100,000 back in the day, <laughs> this stuff is going to become cheaper and cheaper. There's going to be early adopters, 
But over time, it's going to become more accessible and it's, it's going to democratize health for everyone because this stuff can actually keep you healthy. And like Mark said, if you can keep people healthy, energetic, not depressed, all this other stuff, they're going to want to move, they're going to want to exercise, and that's how you keep society healthy. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's really like a disservice to public health what they do w with this stuff because, you know, with like, I don't want to go, I mean, COVID's whatever, but like with that stuff, they were so gung-ho about promoting that stuff, but then it's like, why don't you ever promote like lifestyle? And like, I just never understand, or create a society mm. where it makes it easy for people to live a good lifestyle. Because the society, it's, it comes down to the environment, right? In, environment to a certain extent does dictate behavior. Humans, un, for the most mm -hmm. humans, you know, that's just a lot of it humans. Massively, are, it massively uh, dictates your behavior. I mean, just think about if you uh, live somewhere where it's really, really cold. It's just that much harder to get yourself outside for a walk or something like that. And, and in Canada, we have some of the highest autoimmune rates in the world, like multiple sclerosis and other conditions. Why is mm -hmm. that? It's, I think it's obviously vitamin D is part of it, but it's also because people don't exercise or are not willing to exercise for half the year. Like it's mm -hmm. really tough for them. So I think the, you know, setting an environment where cheap food is accessible, processed food, where it's like, you know, people rather take their cars and walk, like all this, like there's just so many ways that the public, the, the government could create an infrastructure that would allow people to live healthier lives, but they don't want to invest in that, right? Like, so that, that and that was my thing during, I was just kind of like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, necessarily anti, I think it was over prescribed a little bit, but the point is they never really talked about the other stuff that you can do to make your body protected from it, including like peptides, like peptides, like there's in, in Russia, they Russia's Russia, but they did a lot of studies on peptides, and they're they're that's where peptides actually pioneered from. And so they were doing pe peptides with like something called thymolin, which can actually help to treat, and it can help reduce, uh, you know, uh, recurrence of it. It can reduce hospital stays, and it's harmless. But here, like no one was talking about it. Mm -hmm. And then same thing with IV stem cells and IV exosomes. They can treat. There's over like forty randomized control trials on that. Yet there was not one headline about stem cells treating. So mm -hmm. it's just to me, it's just like. What like what are they doing? Right? It just it makes you question things. Can you uh, fix Aaron Rodgers' torn Achilles tendon? I'm a Jets fan. Can you, can you help him out? I got a, I got many messages about him, including one of his coaches. But uh, yeah, no, we he he ended up doing surgery, and I think he just did PRP. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was just staying on the conservative side. But I yeah, I, I'm pretty. I have fixed Achilles tears uh, with using stem cells, including yeah. ruptures without surgery, and we have protocols to get them back faster. So instead of taking like nine months to a year, we could get them back in like six months or so. Mm -hmm. So I think you know if if he came to me right away, I think I could have gotten back faster. But mm. his loss. <laughs> that's wild that it can repair something that's torn. And then uh, have you seen some people? Uh, be able to move um, with better range of motion? Because I'm imagining like if an area was shut off for a long time that maybe you couldn't, uh, maybe your range of motion would still be, because it's, it's not just the pain. It's sometimes you uh, end up with dysfunction throughout the whole body. Have you seen people really improve their ability to move on top of uh, getting them out? out of yeah, pain? and I'm always it's I'm always about like combining different modalities. So I won't tell people like, and this is a problem with a lot of those stem cell clinics too. They'll just do their injection and they'll be like, peace. Good yeah. luck. Hope you, hope it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for me, it's like I like having a post procedure protocol mm -hmm. and making sure they're doing the right rehab for biomechanics. Because why did the dysfunction happen in the first place? It's biomechanics. So it's and that's the problem with a lot of doctors. I think still they look at just structural problems, but there's biomechanical problems and also inflammatory problems that can lead to chronic pain. So I like to treat all of it. And the way you do that is after the tear is fixed you get them to look at their scapula, like if it's a shoulder tear, you look at your scapula, look at your neck, look at all the movement mechanics of how their scapula is moving and their shoulder and restore that. And I find if, as long as you fix the structural problems, every people do get back their range of motion. Like obviously if you have like bone on bone, advanced osteoarthritis, you may not get back full range of motion, but even then everyone's range of motion does improve. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning like you, you know, you have someone who's hip, they can barely move because they have so much arthritis. And then after the treatments, they can move it like usually 20, 30 degrees more, which is still a pretty significant difference. There's so many things to talk about as far as stem cells here are concerned. But with what you just mentioned right there, the low hanging fruit as far as lifestyle, right? Like we left muscle mass, I believe is important for longevity, but what are the things that you think that people should be doing already? Because People are going to want to get on this either way. But what do you be doing outside of this to extend your life to? I think you mentioned to us, people should be able to live to 150. Yeah. No, I think on, I think the generation, 
I mean, it, it's really the first generation where people are exercising and taking care of their bodies, right? Like mm -hmm. in people in their 50s and 60s, they've been doing it since they were in their 20s or 30s. So I think that alone, if you, if you think that, I think that alone will add like, let's say the oldest person was 120, right? But that oldest 120 was like, with what, really? Like, I don't know, they were just living in a normal life. <laughs> they weren't like doing exercise, they weren't optimizing their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think at a minimum, you can, you should, you can add at least like, like let's say 20% because of lifestyle optimization. Yeah. And then you have everything else with the intravenous stem cells and the anti-aging stuff with the gene therapy. So let's talk about that gene therapy because it's pretty exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we have the world's first reversible plasmid gene therapy. What that means is instead of using a viral vector, we're using a bacterial vector. However, it's just a plasmid, which is just a strand of DNA that exchanges information. So there's no live bacteria in there. So that's the cool thing. It's just a circular strand of DNA. And hence the name of the company that we have is called Mini Circle because it's just a mini circle. But traditionally, people to do gene therapies had to use viral vectors. And to manufacture viruses are expensive, number one. And number two, there's always risk with viruses. Like there's always a risk that they can translocate. And then once you do it, they're not reversible. And then they, they also can't be repeated. So eventually they'll wear off after 10 years, whereas this one can be repeated. So there's a lot of benefits to the plasmid gene therapy over viral vectors. So I think that once you understand that, then you kind of understand, oh, wow, this is going to be a really cool technology. So it's a platform for any protein or peptide in your body that we can target. So the first one we did was called follistatin. Why did we do follistatin? Because I'm of the belief that muscle is the most important organ in the body. And it is the organ of longevity, as Gabrielle Lyon has said. Mm -hmm. And I agree with her 100%. And basically, if we can preserve muscle mass, we can slow down aging probably the most. But then there's also so many other benefits of the follistatin. It also, not only does it inhibit myostatin, so it increases lean body mass, it's super anti-catabolic. So we did, in our phase one trial, we did DEXA scans on everyone and we had patients, some patients who lost like 15, 20% body fat and no muscle. So that's the beauty of it. Like unlike Ozempic wow. or like, mm. you know, even trisipatide or like other <laughs> pharmaceuticals, yeah. people lose muscle and fat. Mm. And so this is super anti-catabolic, meaning you're not going to lose any muscle while you're, while you're, even if you're dieting, even if you're not eating enough protein or doing enough resistance training, mm -hmm. which is really cool about it. Quick I question. Think, oh, I think for ahead. body fat, I think you said uh, percentage, but you probably meant pounds. You said 10 to, fi 10 to 15 pounds. Uh, oh, I meant a total body weight. Yeah. 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 Okay. I was just yeah, thinking yeah. like, that's yeah, yeah. like a crazy amount for <laughs> someone to cut, like for, for someone who's 20% body fat. I was like, yeah, whoa. Like, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Was, body weight. Yeah. Body. Sign me up. <laughs> and, and on that too, actually, uh, were there any other interventions that were going on with these individuals that were using that? We wanted to really isolate the effect of the fall of statin. So mm -hmm. we, we tried to control for that as much as possible. Okay. Uh, there were some people exercising, some people not, which was interesting to see too, because even the people who weren't exercising, some of them increased their lean body mass. So how crazy is that? That you can, that with the fall of statin, some people put on like, there was one guy who put on like five pounds of lean body mass and he literally wasn't exercising. Like that's wild. And he lost like six pounds of body fat. Like, wow. so that to me, it's like body recomposition, right? Body recomposition is so hard, as you guys know, to lose fat and to gain muscle. It's not easy. And so anything we can do to make that easier is going to have a huge impact on society. Uh, and so there's the muscular benefits, but then there's the anti-aging benefits, which are just wild in some people. So we, on average, like the intrinsic biological age reduction for people over 60 was about 11 years. But for people, you know, in their 40s, 50s was still like six, seven years, which is pretty significant. And so, but then there's some people who are super responders that we're trying to figure out why. We're probably gonna do some genetic testing on them. But mm -hmm. there was there was <laughs> one one girl, she's only 28. Her biological age was 28. And then after the fall stat in six months, it went down to 12. Yo, yo, whoever's married to that girl, divorce immediately. <laughs> She's 12 now, dog. Oh, and I'm like, what are you talking about? We made, her, we made her into a child. <laughs> <laughs> that crazy. But that was insane. We're like, what? This is crazy. And then there was people who like, one guy was 66 and we made his biological age go down by like 36 years. So he's like in his young 30s now. Like, it's like wild what? stuff. Okay. This is intrinsic biological age. If anyone yeah. who knows anything about aging, intrinsic biological age is very hard to alter. It's because it doesn't, it's, it's at a cellular level, like we're talking about the hallmarks of aging, it's you're actually making the cells healthier, 
which is cellular function, cellular efficiency, how your body does everything, right? Because everything comes back to cellular dysfunction, yeah. metabolics, everything is about the cell and how it functions. So if we're making your cells healthier at an intrinsic level, it's pretty pretty wild if you think about it. And so I think the application of this is going to be massive, not just follow statin, but we have a whole pipeline of products mm -hmm. so we can make, because we can do different targets, right? Yeah. Um, but this is just our first one. And so our phase two trial we're planning to do in Japan. Uh, the reason is because Japan has the oldest aging population in the world and mm. sarcopenia and osteopenia are huge problems there. And the follow statin increases bone density as well. So it'll be so. Our, how? Well, how? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think through uh, it's, it's a GDF eleven. It, uh, there's a growth factor and it stimulates increased bone density. Mm. And so it's uh, it's really cool. Yeah, and that's why and and it has no side effects right now for bone density. If you're a woman and you have low bone density, you have to take something called bisphosphonates, and those mm -hmm. drugs are harsh, and they can have like they can cause necrosis of your jaw, and they barely work based off the studies too. Again, like pharmaceutical companies do a lot of statistical fuckery basically and mm -hmm. they just and they tend to do that with a lot of drugs for chronic disease mm -hmm. uh, and so this has no side effects has a lot of potential for benefit it's perfectly safe and so I'm you know I think it's really going to change a lot of people's lives and our goal is to eventually have people cover it but that's going to take time uh, Japan our vision for that is if we could do a phase two trial there showing it does sarcopenia and osteopenia we'd want the government to eventually say hey let's let's get this to all our people because mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want it for all your people? Yeah. It's you know, it's one of those things that we want millions or eventually like tens of millions of people to do. And how big was your uh, test group? Like how many people were involved? Uh, that trial was about fifty people. Okay, but we've done it for over now. It's probably like around two hundred people. Got sebum on it too. I saw it right. <laughs> yeah, sebum. I just did it last week. Yeah, I did it for him. Yeah, and he's gonna. It's not fair. It's not definitely not. Fair. <laughs> he's bad, <best>, dude. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I, but that that's the thing. Whoever. Mm. <laughs> So whoever I, you know, whoever I gets to be, I, that's why I'm kind of like a exclusive doctor now. It's really hard to get into me, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it's, you basically get unfair advantage if I'm your doctor. Yeah. So because we also did IV stem cells for him, and he says he feels the best he's ever felt for his prep because oh, he doesn't feel tired and he doesn't feel his <sighs> joints don't hurt. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so it's like it's obviously you know, um, I mean for pro athletes like I've done it for NFL guys too and NHL guys and. Um, WADA can't test for it. I mean, there's no way to test for it. It's it's one of those things that <laughs> isn't detectable. So um, personally, I don't think even if it is performance enhancing, to me, it's not about that. It's about protecting people's bodies and yes. not al allowing them to recover faster, reduce inflammation. Like why would WADA against, be against, and that's another thing, it's, it question it, right? Why is WADA against people using like BPC? Mm. BPC-157 is a, it's a peptide that helps with, it's like the Wolverine peptide, right? It's the one that helps with regeneration, healing. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you not want your athletes to use that if they get injured? Like, it, it's just kind of weird, right? Like, the, and instead what they do, and I've had NFL guys happen to this, is like they get a cortisol, cortisol injection every week during the 16 weeks. Yeah. And then they, just, they destroy their joints. And because the, their doctor doesn't even tell them that the, the cortisone eats away at cartilage. It's chondrotoxic. Mm -hmm. So out of the uh, roughly 200 p people that you've tested it on, has there has there been any non-responders? Because <clears throat> you mentioned super responders, but has there anybody just like not really gotten any benefit? Not yet. Yeah. So I'm hoping that it will stay that way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's consistently everyone, <clears throat> I would say the least clinical benefits, uh, and at the very least, are people who don't, maybe they don't get that many strength gains, but they get energy boost still. Every single person gets like, an, feels better in the morning when they wake up, have mm -hmm. more energy, able to bounce back faster, that type of stuff. Um, so that's 100% consistent in every single person. And there's been no adverse effects. That's the beauty <clears throat> of it. Um, and everyone, once it wears off, they want it done again. And that's what I was going to ask next. How long does one treatment usually last? Yeah, one and a half to two years. And then once it wears off, everyone's like, please, I need it now. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. because you feel so great on it. And then if you, and the, the cool part is it has a kill switch. So basically you can take a tetracycline <laughs> antibiotic and it'll kill the plasmid vector. So it's reversible. And that's mm -hmm. why it's called reversible. It's the only reversible gene therapy in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool technology. And um, I don't know why you would want to have your body, but let's just say for whatever reason, you're like, I'm, I don't want to be strong and energetic. <laughs> just, just taking it, touch like lean. I'm too strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's some interesting, uh, interesting stuff. Um, how did you get into this stuff? Like, how did you, you know, like you were practicing medicine, you wanted to be a doctor, but like, how did you end up falling yeah. into a lot of this stuff? Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting journey. Cause like, in medical school, I was kind of like the oddball because I was like watching your YouTube videos <laughs> <laughs> and like watching Ed Cohn and watching like, uh, you know, like I, I was a huge fan of Eric Helms and like Omar. Yeah, and stuff. I used yeah. to watch those guys all the time in med school. And like, I was just super, I was just a bro. I'm like a gym bro <laughs> at heart. That's just who I am. And then, so for me, it was kind of weird. I was like, 
why are they teaching me all this stuff, but they're not teaching me how to treat the root cause? And so that was always the question I asked from day one. And then everyone in my med school class was just kind of like, who cares? Like they're just, because most doctors are interested in like surgery or like, you know, the one, and then the ones who are interested in like preventative care, they're just like, you know, by the book, pharmaceutical stuff. Right. And so for me, it was always like, no, there has to be more. And so that's how I got into functional medicine, integrative medicine, read a bunch of books on that. Uh, and then eventually I got exposed to regenerative medicine. Uh, Dr. Anthony Gallia, he was my mentor in that. And he was like, he was the first one in the world to do PRP actually. So he started the whole PRP, which is like old tech now, but back then, like 20 years ago, it was new tech. You know, the cool thing real quick is like, I got PRP in my knee when I was 16 because of Oshkut Slaughter and it made a big difference mm -hmm. back then, right? Yeah, exactly. It's so, wild. Yeah, exactly. So Tony was the guy who did it for like Mike Tyson, Tiger Woods, like he did for Madonna. He did for like every, every big celebrity because, so he was my mentor mm -hmm. in regenerative medicine. And then I was kind of just like, you know, because I, got, I went through a similar thing with like, you know, your family did. I lost my sister like seven, eight years ago now. And that when you have that type of tragedy in your family too, you're kind of like, how do I use this pain to help or make a difference? And that was the way I found meaning in it. Mm -hmm. It was like, I want to help as many people as possible. And doing it through pharmaceuticals and surgery, I knew was not the way. Because I, I just felt like there's, we can go to, if we go back to first principles or fundamental principles and the root cause of disease and function, and now we can understand be that better than ever, we can help a lot of people and change a lot of lives. So that, that was always my motivation. It was just like about scaling everything. And I, I kind of got lucky because... I invested in Tesla in 2016 to 2020. And because during oh. that, and yeah. And so I, be, I basically became financially independent at 32. So I didn't. <laughs> so good for you. So, but but, but it's, awesome. it's good because when you don't have to work for money, it gives you creativity. It gives you space to mm -hmm. think and be like, okay, what do I actually want to do with my life? Yeah. Like, how do I want to make a difference? Because money, I, I've treated the richest family in the world. Uh, they're worth 3.2 trillion in the Middle East. And like money doesn't buy you happiness. Like it, it just gives you something to, gives you options and maybe gives you freedom, but it doesn't give, make you happy necessarily and give you full fulfillment. Mm. And so that's where I was kind of like, I, again, back, come back to the thing. To me, I get fulfillment from helping people and making a difference. But then be, just being a regular doctor and treating people is great, but I can only help so many people with my own hands. And so I was like, how do I scale this? So that's where the technology stuff came in. And then, so I just got into technology, emerging tech and like, and then this just fell into my lap basically. It was like perfect timing because mm -hmm. the, the two scientists who invented it approached me and they liked what I was doing and my philosophies. And so we aligned very well. So then I joined their company and now it's like, you know, I think we're going to be able to create so many amazing technologies together. This is just the first one, but we're working on even, we're going to Mexico um, in a few weeks and we're creating gene edited cells for cancer. Um, they're called N CAR NK cells and CAR T cells and dendritic cells. They're basically different cell lines to help your body to fight cancer. And they've been shown to be effective um, not only in Japan, but even in the U.S. CAR T is approved, but it's super expensive and inaccessible. So we want to make it more accessible to more people because cancer has not really innovated in many years. Like if you look at the data, like people are maybe living four weeks longer over the last like you know, decade in terms of like how much longer people are actually living with the current treatments. Mm -hmm. So it's not that significant. So I feel like there's so many chronic diseases out there where people are still suffering and lives are being lost. And, you know, if I can make a huge difference on that, hopefully that's what I want to do. Is some of this uh, gene therapy, is it doing anything specific to hormones or is it just in like, for lack of a better term, is it just uh, maybe like amplifying the entire body so it can be optimal. It's not necessarily like raising testosterone or growth hormone. Or exactly, exactly. Because when you age- it's Like maybe optimizing exactly. the whole because body. Because the follistatin levels decrease as you age. And that, uh, and our next product is something called copper peptide. A copper peptide is really good for your skin, but it's also a bioregulator, which means it has different effects at uh, methylation level. And so it has all these cool benefits of anti-aging. And so, but as you get older, your copper, le your, copper pep your copper levels fall pretty precipitously. And so basically the gene therapy will just optimize Optimize them. So, and then that's the same thing with testosterone. Same thing with so many different gene therapies that we're working on. <laughs> so basically, this is what I imagine. You come into our, you come into our, our clinic it's called Eterna. You come into our Eterna clinic, and you basically reprogram, reprogram your whole body. You could do a bunch of injections, and your gene, you're genetically modified, and you're going to be like optimized and good yeah. to go. Can you pass down the those genetically modified genes? No, no. Okay. Because it, that's the cool thing about the plasmid. It's not actually translocating into your nucleus. Mm -hmm. It's just sending a signal to your body to help increase production of whatever peptide we're targeting. Power Project family, if you're trying to increase your muscle mass, if you're trying to lose body fat, if you're trying to stick to a nutrition plan, if you're trying to get fit, pretty much if there's anything you're trying to do for your health, we know that sleep is the biggest determining factor to help you get from point A to point B. That's why we've been sleeping on 8C mattresses for probably 
more than two years now. And the main reason is the technology behind the Pod Pro. Now, the Pod Pro is like the Tesla of beds. It will change its temperature based off of how you're sleeping during the night. And if you have a partner that's sleeping on the other side, they can have their own temperature settings. We all sleep hot here, and I used to wake up in a puddle of my own sweat. Gross. That doesn't happen anymore because of the eight sleep mattress, and I've been getting the best sleep of my life. Now, if you don't want to replace your mattress, you can just get the Pod Pro cover, and you can put that over your current mattress to get all the benefits of eight sleep. But if you also need to replace your old nasty mattress, <laughs> you can get the Pod Pro cover and the eight sleep mattress. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, yeah, so you guys got to head over to eightsleep.com slash power project, and you guys will automatically receive $150 off of your order. Uh, again, eightsleep.com slash power project. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. How do we make some mutant kids? <laughs> <laughs> well, this Chinese doctor tried that and he got arrested. So <laughs> their uh, gene edited embryos are a real are, are a real thing now that you can do, but there's so many ethical. You have a child, right? Yeah. Is your I, wife like worry that you're <laughs> chasing your kid around? <laughs> Get over here. <laughs> Put oh. something in their snack. <laughs> It's like he's he's six feet tall. He's only oh, one and a half jacks. years old. Like, yeah, like what's going on here? Oh yeah, my kids are gonna get access to all the best stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they'll be, they'll be uh, yeah, no, it's like it it is wild if you think about it. Because if you can create gene edited embryos, you can select for whatever traits you want to enhance or even or obviously in disease cases delete. Because there are genetic conditions like out there that you can you want to obviously you don't want to pass down no. like Huntington's disease, right? Like imagine if you could you have two parents that have Huntington's and then you could gene edit the embryo to take out that gene. That's actually a real possibility now. It's um, there's just a lot of ethical issues on like how do we regulate it because once you start it's like, yeah, edit out the Huntington's and then insert you know something some superpower <laughs> something, exactly you know? yeah like insert penis enlargement <laughs> but you could you could be, like you could theoretically insert certain things that you do want yeah that's what yeah. I'm saying you could choose like uh, theoretically you could do eye color like hair type like heights you could put on the other so there's so many things you could do but then it, it just it opens up Pandora's box right yeah. mm, yeah. and then that's where elitism could come in too right because that would be a very expensive mm. technology and then imagine you have society where only the rich people can afford that and then that you go down that hole right and then that I and that, that may We're I hope that doesn't happen but that, man, you know <laughs> yeah but even the gene therapy stuff, our vision with it, even though it's expensive right now, my vision, our vision with it is to eventually have it accessible and affordable to everyone. So mm -hmm. everyone can get like one injection every two years and it can really change the natural disease of like natural course of disease and aging. And you talked about in the gym a bit, like you mentioned phallostatin, but you also mentioned like, I don't know if you just mentioned one for testosterone, but you know, there's a lot of guys who use TRT and they have to have continuous injections all the time. But you mentioned there's something that is around the horizon where it could elevate an individual's testosterone, but they are producing that on their own. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So how does so, that work? Well, exactly. It's the same. It's a plasmid gene therapy technology, yeah. except we put the gene in for testosterone production and then sends a signal to your own, your body cells to increase that production of testosterone. And then the, we, we can titrate it based off how much you need. So it'd be like customized gene therapy for everyone's testosterone mm -hmm. level. So instead of having to inject yourself every week or twice a week or whatever, which is super annoying for TRT. Mm -hmm. You just do one gene therapy and you're good for one and a half to two years. And also theoretically, since everything's working together, mm -hmm. since your body's producing that set amount of testosterone, other functions would probably improve as a byproduct of that, not well, just your testosterone. Yeah, exactly. Well, testosterone also, I mean, the reason I think it works so well is because it, 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 it like Mark was saying, it basically allows people to feel better. They have more energy, they have more strength, they, mm -hmm. they, have, they just feel better overall they're going to work out more, they're going to exercise more, they're going to be more motivated to eat better, all that stuff, right? I think that's why a lot of these things work so well in the first place. It just allows them to do the fundamentals. Yeah. yeah so if, oh, go ahead. if um, I mean, someone on TRT, right, it's just like it's you know one or two injections a week. It's pretty straightforward. So what's the treatment like for the like one and a half, two year treatment that you were just explaining? Yeah, that's, that's the beauty. I guess I didn't mention it. The beauty of this technology is it's literally a subcutaneous injection. You this I just did it for. Um, do you guys know Juji Mufu? Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He's he, he's 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 hilarious. He's like I'm I'm. He needs to be leaner and more jacked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? So yeah. we just did the follow statin for him. That's insane. And then he's he like, doesn't he, need follow statin. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, thank you, thank you for making me uh, GMO'd. 
So he's he's excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> so, but he's uh, but his biological age was uh, forty three, and so we're going to track it. So we'll be posting in three to six months, and we'll see how much we reduce it. He's by. only twenty seven, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> wait, how old are you? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's thirty nine. He's thirty. He's thirty nine. Yeah. Wait, wait. wait. Forty. Yeah. But so, but his biological age was higher. Was, was so that's higher. why he was he was, he's like upset. Wow. But obviously, I think, and this is why I think it's going to be a huge industry for the bodybuilding world, especially maybe retired ones, but even people like Chris Bumstead, who he's really interested in health and longevity. Mm-hmm. That he wants to make sure that after he retires, he can still do whatever he wants to do and not have to worry about his health. Mm. So he's investing in his health early on, which is why we're doing everything for him. And he's a smart guy. I think he's a really smart guy. And he's, uh, but I think anabolic steroids and the way a lot of people train definitely accelerates aging. Mm-hmm. Has like, that a trend you've noticed? With I mean, if you just look at body, a lot of bodybuilders' faces, <laughs> like <laughs> they look <laughs> tired. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they look age, they look age right it's not uh, they, and that's I, I you know and there's that's the marker of like what's going on internally right mm-hmm. when you when your face looks older that's that's a sign of what's going on inside too so I think if um, and Juji will be a great case study and obviously Chris is young so it doesn't matter as much but it'll be great to show everyone how much we can decrease his biological age I'm sure it'll be at least six seven years and mm. he's gonna feel great on the fall stat end but then we're probably gonna do the IV stem cells for him too he's, I think he's gonna come down to Cabo Mm. So is follow statin available in the states? And um, we do it in Mexico, Mexico. and uh, Honduras, and then uh, well, Prospera. That's like where we have our clinical trials as well. Uh, just because uh, again, the regulation here is just so strict, so we mm. do our trials offshore, so we can expedite them and get things done quickly, right, and move things along. Because otherwise, like at least one state where we can like anything goes, you know, Montana. Mm. <laughs> oh, that is. The governor just recently changed the law. So we're thinking of oh, opening well, there it. there we go. Yeah. He, he, so phase one in, investigational uh, things like stem cells, gene therapy can be used there now without repercussions for doctors. Oh, nice. Planning our vacation already. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, so we're probably going to build a clinic in Montana. Let's go. Uh, literally, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what does that treatment cost, though? Uh, it's it's 25000 right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in the next year or so, we'll, we'll probably hopefully get the price a bit lower. But as with, I was saying, any new technology... It's going to be expensive, right? And there's going to be early adopters. And there's a lot six of- months of ads on the show, and we can yeah. you know, maybe swap it out, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting the better deal here. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, for some other things that might go on people? Um, you know, you, you did, I think you did mention earlier, like arthritis. Uh, my grandpa, when he was old, he as he was aging, um, his he had a hard time with his moving yeah. his hands around. They were, they were like puffy. And things like that. And what about things like uh, eyesight and hearing? And yeah, what do we got for some of that stuff? No, it's 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 that's a cool thing, right? And like instead of just having generic stem cells, we're gonna have customized stem cells for different issues. So for ophthalmology, you can have you can have different cell lines than you have for like osteoarthritis because they di- they're more likely to differentiate into the tissue that you want because they're gene edited and they're customized for whatever you're trying to achieve. Mm. So we actually have an ophthalmologist on our team and he does uh, stem cell injections for retinitis pigmentosa, which is a inherited condition where they go blind basically. Uh, but this, but stem cells can actually slow it down and reverse it to a certain extent. Mm. Uh, but we're actually going to make a gene therapy for that as well. Uh, and then the most common thing is like age related macular degeneration, right? It's just like AMD. They just people at aging, right? Yeah. What is that? That's again, same, same under Lying path I visit. do think there's like eye drops for it now that kind of mimic we have, uh, you having like readers on for X amount of hours or something like that. Not know. not that yet, but we have uh, we do have exosome eye drops which can mm. be used for dry eyes, mm. and it can actually like treat it so that you do a course of it and you don't have to keep using those eye drops to lub- keep lubricating them because mm-hmm. it helps to make your body's own production of like the lubricant. Mm. Uh, but the point is, you can do stem cell and exosome injections for AMD. Um, and it's a much better alternative than what they have available, just like standard of care in terms of like improving eye, eye vision and eyesight. Mm. So even if like my vision's been pretty shitty since like day one, like it would still help me? Depends on what the cause is, right? Mm-hmm. And because you have to understand the underlying cause. If it's obviously just a genetic thing, then only a gene therapy could help that. But if it's like a more degenerative process or inflammatory process, mm-hmm. like most things are, then stem cells can help that. Mm. How about neurological disorders like Alzheimer's? And- yeah, well, I, I mean, one thing that is, I think, is not talked about enough are like certain, like certain peptides. Like insulin is a peptide. Mm-hmm. It's been around forever. I think everyone knows insulin. But yeah. you can actually do something called intranasal insulin. And it works. Like- as, yeah. And it, it goes straight to your brain. And it increases white cortex matter. It's been, it's been studied like 
there's a lot of PubMed studies on it, but again, because it's not patentable, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's no patent on insulin. You can't, right? And so yeah. you're not going to get like lots of press on it. But it, the fact that there's something that can even help dementia and has good studies on it, but isn't talked about is like a disservice to our patients, right? And like, because there's so many people suffering with mild cognitive impairment, dementia. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are calling it type three diabetes because of the chronic inflammation and insulin resistance that happens. Yeah. And it's so linked to type two diabetes because of the blood sugar dysregulation and everything. So intranasal insulin is such an easy thing that you can do that has no side effects, very safe, and it can help improve your memory and your cognition. And then we can combine that with like intravenous stem cells and exosomes because exosomes, the way I explain them is basically like, imagine you have chicken soup, the chicken, the meat part is the stem cells, and then the broth is the exosomes. So it has all the nutrients in there, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the cells. And why is that important? Because then they can go everywhere. They can cross the blood brain barrier. Because the stem cells can't cross that. So they cro- when you do it intravenously, they can cross it and they can help with uh, neuroinflammation. They can help with neurogenesis, stimulating growth of nerve cells. And then we also have an interventional radiologist on our team. This guy's a badass. He's, uh, he's been doing this stuff for 10 years in Middle East and Iran and stuff like that. And he actually injects stem cells directly into the brain. Wow. And, mm. yeah. and then he also injects them mm. into... Um, How do you go of- into the brain? Uh, That's like the back of the head. The nose. <laughs> you can go. Well, he does. He does the carotid artery to feed it into the brain. But then oh. you can also do interventional neuro. It's, inter, it's called interventional neuroradiology. You use live imaging and you go into the vessels in the brain. What 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 type of results has he seen doing that? <laughs> He's it's been incredible. He's like patients like like even if you have severe dementia, you can usually take them back a stage. Is what we we wow. usually tell people. So wow. if you have severe, you can go to moderate. If you have moderate, you can go mild. If you have mild, you can go back basically being normal. So what? that's kind of where we're at right now. But once we combine it with like our gene therapies that we're working on, we're pretty confident we'll be able to reverse things almost completely. Would that nasal spray be something that would be preventative? Exactly. I'm doing, I do it, I'm just starting to test it on myself just for cognition and focus. And it, I've noticed difference. And Dave Asprey, he's done it like, so it's like a biohacking thing too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just to mess with your blood sugar, you need carbs. No, that's the cool thing. Because it's not going into your bloodstream. <laughs> that's it's not going, yeah, too. No, exactly. It's not going into your bloodstream. It just, it just goes down and gets processed by your mm. uh, body. Yeah. So, and there's no, wow. even if you overdose by whatever reason, like usually you just do 20 IUs, but like if you like by accident do more or whatever, it's not going to cause any mm. blood sugar effects. So yeah. super safe. So where is that something like that found? Is that well, that's the problem. You can't even, you can't get, <laughs> you'd have to get a, you basically have to get a doctor who would know what they're doing with peptides, which there's probably like a few dozen in the States mm. that would know how to prescribe it and stuff like that. So Fuck. <laughs> but can't we have it at Walmart or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could just. I mean, the problem is if you could get a prescription, I guess, and do it yourself. But it's it, you, it's better to have a doctor supervise you, right? Mm. Just because they can tell you the dosing and the protocols. Yeah, you never know what the hell is going to happen. Yeah. No. No. Exactly. But I think you know the this guy, the interventional radiologist. He's he's coming. He comes with us to Mexico, and he can do injections into the heart, into the liver, into the kidneys, all with stem cells. He's had patients who had CHF, like congestive heart failure, which is basically heart, heart failure, mm-hmm. like who had like 15% ejection fraction. And then after stem cells, they went up to like 40%. That's like life-changing. Like it goes wow. from basically being not able to walk because you're out of breath all the time and your yeah. legs are becoming swollen to being able to like exercise. Yeah. Mm. And again, that's what it's all about, getting people to exercise again, getting them to move again so they don't get deconditioned. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times with chronic disease, that's what happens, right? As soon as they... They become, they get Parkinson's, they get whatever, they, they become off balance, they can't exercise, and then just, you just keep falling down from there. there and the drugs don't do anything to reverse that, right? Their drugs are just, all they're doing is treating the symptoms. Um, Parkinson's is actually really interesting because there's a trial that just came out it's from Blue Rock Therapeutics, which acquired the stem cell company, and they made their own proprietary stem cell technology, specifically for Parkinson's, mm-hmm. to increase dopamine. Because dopamine is lowered when you in Parkinson's disease. That's one of the hallmarks of it. And they actually injected the stem cells directly into the brain. Mm-hmm. And then they, they found there was, two, there was two groups, a low-dose group and a high-dose group. And the high-dose group did better, but everyone responded really well to it and got better over time. Like their rigidity, their motor symptoms, because those, those stem cells actually turned into new neuro- neurons and generated more dopamine. So that's true engraftment and true regenerative, because they're, they're using the iPSC cells I was talking about earlier. Yeah. That's the second gen tech, IPSC. Mm. What about for things like, um, I don't know, there's so many things that plague our country, but like, uh, I guess like diabetes, heart disease. You did mention a little bit about heart disease already. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, with diabetes, we can actually inject the stem cells directly into the pancreatic artery. So it goes into the pancreas and it can help. You guys are doing some of this now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, My IR guy has been doing it for years and he's had patients who've been able to come off insulin. 
And uh, wow. there's a trial. There's been trials done in those parts of the world, like Iran, India. Um, there are clinical studies from there showing that this is an effective strategy. Again, that's very safe, um, has minimal risk with it, and can help people get off insulin. And plus, and you guys no work harm. on lifestyle interventions, of course. Yeah, too. optimizing yeah. peptides. We have a life. We have a nutritious biochemist who works with them on lifestyle. <clears throat> like I always think that's the <clears throat> foundation. But yeah. a lot of people are coming to us because they've already usually tried that stuff. Okay, and then they're kind of like, "What's my?" options, you know, mm. what I'm usually like their last resort. <laughs> so, and then they're, they're hoping that we have something that can help them. And most times we do. Um, I think with coronary artery disease, we don't, we don't have anything specific for that yet. We can, we can treat after you have a heart attack or after you have heart failure, we can help with that because you can help with scar tissue and you can help with the heart function. But the problem with coronary artery disease is that it's just, it's built up a plaque and calcifications and all these inflammatory cells. So we're working, we have some ideas on gene therapies for that, but we don't have any specific intervention for that yet. How about something like depression? Because you just mentioned like dopamine. Oh yeah. Well, the V shot, as we're calling it. Well, the V shot, <laughs> if you Google it, it comes mm-hmm. up as vaginal shot, but we're gonna rebrand we're gonna rebrand that. <laughs> Andrew, the V shot Googling him. So hold on, let me gotta double check. <laughs> the V shot, as we, we call it, we do it's called the vagus nerve injection. And we inject it into the vagus nerve, which is in the in the front of your neck, and there's something called the stellate ganglion which feeds into your central nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm-hmm. And so what happens, we know that, like Paul Conti, he's a, he's a well-known psychiatrist, he talks a lot mm-hmm. about unresolved emotional trauma kind of being the root of many mental health disorders. Yeah. And one of the other things is neuroinflammation. And so we're, those are two things we're kind of treating. Basically, by treating the vagus nerve with peptides or even exosomes, it, it has an anti-inflammatory effect and also helps to reset the nervous system. So I've, had, I've, had, I've done it for young girls. I've done it for girls with panic attacks, Obviously, people with anxiety, PTSD. We're working with the Canadian military to try to get this covered, so that the Canada you know, has military. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, two, so it's nice. like two people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Devin Laird would be upset about Devin, you know Devin, <laughs> yeah. the armless guy. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing the false time for him next week. He's, mm-hmm. uh, but he's a huge military guy. We've talked about, you know, how can we get this covered for the mm-hmm. vets? Because there's so many vets out there with PTSD, and oh, yeah. there's like no mm-hmm. options for them, right? And the V shot can actually make a huge difference, and we can combine that with intervening exosomes because that cross the blood brain barrier and help with neuroinflammation and then ideally what we like to do but we can't do it everywhere is we like to combine it with like psilocybin or ketamine assisted therapy um, wow. because then you get like the whole kind of package of uh, resetting their body right mm-hmm. and resetting their mind resetting their nervous system because mm-hmm. that's the whole principle behind it right there's so many unresolved unconscious issues that people need to go through and they need the they need the psilocybin assisted therapy to work through those yeah let me ask you something with like the gene therapy stuff because there, there's so many different applications there's phallostat and there's one for testosterone there's all of these do you guys are you guys at all packaging certain things into like okay this will give you these three benefits if you want just this one benefit like can we bundle that, things are, yeah. you, are you bundling yeah. stuff right yeah no pretty i mean I think our most. You may po- also like this. <laughs> <laughs> Add to cart. <laughs> I mean, penis enlargement, <laughs> follicles. <laughs> uh, yeah. So no, that's uh, we are, are definitely our most popular thing is the anti aging package, which is basically. Uh, the intravenous stem cells with exosomes, the false and gene therapy. And then we also do the stem cell facial. Um, so, cause a lot of people want to look younger too. And it basically lasts for three to four years and it, you avoid getting Botox. Because the problem with Botox, it basically just paralyzes your muscle. It's a toxin, right? And what, so what's see these 60 year old white women all. Yeah. <laughs> Face won't move no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, and once this, the problem is Bo- Botox actually causes muscle atrophy. Oh. And so over time, their face actually sags, right? And oh. that's why it's, Botox is like a cult. Once you're in it, you have to stay in it. <laughs> so, yeah. so if we can get people out of that cult, then that's, that's what we're trying to do. But that's kind of our anti-aging package, I'd say, this is the most popular. But because, we're, because this is such a hot field and we're just growing like exponentially, I just hired a pediatrician which I think is super important to talk about because we can treat autism and cerebral palsy. And like, those are two conditions that the medical community is completely unmet needs. Like those parents are in such tough positions, like having a kid and like being told that there's nothing they can do. And these things can actually make a big difference. Like, again, I was very skeptical of this stuff, but I've seen it firsthand on how much it can change people's lives. And again, and, and there's no harm, right? There's like, it's, yes, maybe it's expensive, but other than that, it's not going to make your kid worse or whatever. And we have a pediatrician who's specializes in that. So, so the kids with autism, how? Like what? Because neuroinflammation. That's the under, that's what we think. It, and, and the microbiome, 
it can, and that's why FMT can help with autism as well. Mm. I, it, what's exactly what are the root causes? If you read about the root causes of autism, it's consistently neuroinflammation and gut dysbiosis and the microbiome, the gut brain access being disturbed and all that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that those are like two of the biggest root causes. It's not like you can necessarily. I mean, there are some people who've literally gone from like not like they're literally not talking to talking. You know, and yeah. that's less change. That's life changing for the parents and their kids mm -hmm. and their and their emotional intelligence, all that stuff, right? So it it can be. And, and it's also one of those things that's like, what else do they have to offer you here, right? It's not like they have anything else to offer you. So I think the people who criticize, you know, unconventional stuff, like, it's like, well, what are you doing for it? Right. Yeah. What's the alternative? <laughs> what about something like uh, ADHD? That uh, neuroinflammation is a component of that. So you can help a little bit with like intravenous exosomes. But I would say the bigger stuff is actually, Dave Asprey showed it to me. It's like this, this band that basically helps you does neurofeedback and helps and you mm. play a game. There's this game you can play. It's called um, Endeavor, I think. Mm. Endeavor OTC. And basically, it's it. You play that and you use neurofeedback. This helmet. Uh, it's not a helmet. It's like a band. Yeah. And basically, it, it can you train your brain. You train your brain to become more focused. It's, and it actually works. Dave said he's had so many people mm. who've treat he's treated with this. And uh, but again, like not promoted a lot because it's yeah. uh, not pharmaceutical based. Right? I heard James Nestor more recently, and James Nestor repeatedly mentions that he's not a doctor. He's a uh, more like a reporter. You know, he just yeah. reports the information. But um, uh, it's his belief through all the research that he's seen and through talking to many doctors that ADHD is actually a sleep disorder which I found to be like super fascinating, but it has a lot to do with hypoxia and sleep apnea and things like that. So how does he treat it? Uh, he tries to teach people to breathe through their nose, mm. tape the mouth shut. A lot of young people end yeah. up like <laughs> breathing And also uh, yeah, that's it. encourages yeah. people to just Ew, chew just hard mouth. foods and things like that to help build up the jaw and the airway and things, things of that nature. Right, yeah, no, that makes sense. I think that, again, you're coming back to first principles, right? Fundamental, what's the root cause? Right. And so if you're doing that and combining it with something like this, I feel like you could change a lot of people with ADHD's lives. Mm. And it's completely against the pharmaceutical mm. route, right? And that the pharmaceutical route is not a good one for ADHD. Like it's um, overprescribed. It causes yeah. addiction issues. Yeah. It, it can lead to blood pressure, heart issues. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all about getting awareness about the alternatives because the standard model is not working. Mm. Let me ask you this. What, uh, you know, like we were talking about things like the standard model of how people treat ADHD or even how people are attempting to work with something like autism, but what are some treatments that you've seen that are very popular that are like, eh, that's, that's, that's not ideal. I know there's probably a bunch. There's too many. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, cortisone for me is like the one that got me into regenerative medicine in the first place because I was a sports doctor initially. Yeah. And, uh, you know, basically that base destroys joints. Like it eats away at cartilage. There's been studies showing that one injection can accelerate the progression of osteoarthritis. So imagine people who get it done all the time, like every three, Whoa. four months. And then the, the funny part is these doctors are combining it with something called Marcaine, which is a, also a chondrotoxic anesthetic. They're not even using the right anesthetic. <laughs> and these guys don't know because they don't read the science. Yeah. Like the science is out there about this stuff, but they don't want to look at the basic science. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to focus on like, you know, like, okay, he's out of pain for a few months and get out of my hair. You know, it's like a 10 minute appointment, do your injection, get out. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's kind of what they're focused on. And I think that's, it, it's, it, but that's with every chronic disease almost, right? Like even with like the most common, obviously is like heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, right? Dementia, like those are like the big four. Yeah. And like, what are we doing for all those? They're just symptomatic management and the drugs aren't really doing anything to reverse it, to slow it down or to even like really make their quality of life a lot better. Like most of them are just like, especially the dementia ones, like those drugs barely do anything, mm -hmm. but they're still prescribed all the time by doctors. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this comes from um, industry, unfortunately. Like the, if you're, if you're a regular doctor, think about what your education is after you finish med school yeah. and after you finish residency. It's like maybe going mm -hmm. once a year to a conference that's funded by a pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's, that's literally what most doctors do. And the medical literature, you know, from 1900 to 1950, it took 50 years for the medical like knowledge database to double. And then every, you know, it was 50 years and then it, it decreased to like 40 years, like 30 years. Guess what it is now for medical knowledge database to double. <laughs> No, four times Fif that. <laughs> 15 years? 73 days. Mm. So imagine going from what? years and years to 
like three months basically. Oh, I see. So oh, it's Jesus it's like Christ. there's so much information yeah, out yeah, yeah. there that's increasing oh, so fast. God, God. So how are how are people gonna keep up with it? Like you and like it's impossible unless you're actually like <laughs> interested in learning medicine and like health and like like reading about the you have to have a you have to see the big picture. And like the big picture is hard to see because there's so much misinformation out there. And I, the reason I think I'm good at seeing the big picture is because of because what happened with Tesla. I remember when it, when they kept people, everyone kept telling me to sell. They're like, "You're crazy for investing in Tesla." Yeah. All the headlines were like, "Tesla's gonna go bankrupt." So that was that's what's called FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of FUD around medicine right now. And it happened during COVID, and it's happening with chronic disease. And the FUD that they did during Tesla was the same thing. And who was that orchestrated by? The oil company companies, right? And they wanted them to go bankrupt. They did not want that company to succeed because it disrupts their entire industry. Yeah. And so it's the same thing with medicine. I see that. I, and I, to me, it's clear as day. So I know I'm on the right path and, you know, and I got to keep, keep on going. <laughs> I want you guys to imagine that you're wearing a cast on your hand and you're going through your whole day with this cast hand. Well, because your fingers don't move, your hand will start to become stiff, weak, and that'll work its way up your arm. That's the same thing that happens when you wear these damn fucking shoes, okay? I'm sorry to curse, but it's frustrating because these shoes that have a narrow toe box, although they look nice in their Nikes, narrow toe box so your toes can't move. They're not flat, so your foot is in this weird thing and it's not getting stronger. And they're not flexible, so they don't move and your foot just moves like this all day, which means your feet are getting weaker. That's why we partner with Vivo Barefoot Shoes. They have a bunch of shoes for the gym and casual shoes, but the thing about these shoes is that they are wide, they are flat, and they are flexible. So your foot can do what it needs to do and it can get stronger over time. That's going to allow you to be a better, stronger athlete. Andrew, how can they get them? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. When you guys get there, you'll see a code across the top. Make sure you use that code for 15% off your entire order. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Throw these oh away. Oh my God. Dude, watch the, watch the camera. What's uh, anything uh, new or different with like peptides? I mean, I, I have heard people talk about like NAD and some of these things being good for... Um, longevity and I think that these might be a little bit more relevant to some of the audience because this is stuff they could have a lot easier access to because um, you can get peptides online in case anybody didn't know. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but the only one I, I would recommend is Can Labs Research. Um, the reason is uh, he, not just because he's a Canadian manufacturer it's because he actually his his biosynthesis of everything is the best I've seen and I've mm. been to, I've seen different manufacturers. The problem with most of the USA manufacturers they say made in US but what they do is they actually manufacture in China and then they just bottle it in the US. Mm. So mm. you got to be careful where you're ordering from but Can Labs Research is like a legit one. Yeah that's the one. Um, John Francois, he's like the godfather of peptides. So he's like the one who taught Matt Cook. Um, he taught me. Uh, he taught. Uh, he's much, much more knowledgeable than William Seeds, even though William Seeds. Yeah, claims it's pretty wild when you start to get down to finding <clears throat> the person that actually made. It was this some guy. Of this stuff is it wild. Guy. It was yeah. this guy. Yeah. Wow. So he has more peptide selection than anyone in the world. And so hmm. you know, I think. Um, not necessarily NAD, but there's one called MOTC, M-O-T-S-C, and that's a mitochondrial peptide. So it helps to increase your body's own production of NAD and helps to make the mitochondria more mm -hmm. efficient. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good peptide if you want to increase cardiovascular capacity, you want to increase performance. I've had NHL athletes who said it changed their whole game because <laughs> they, you know, it's it's performance enhancing, obviously. It increases your cardiovascular. Yeah. M-O-T-S-C. You do five milligrams a day up for 30 days, and then you can decrease the dose to like every other day and eventually find the right dose. But the high dosing is important. I see that uh, th some of these companies are now selling ATP. Uh, so do you have any idea of what that would be used for? No. Why are they selling ATP? I don't know. I just that's what like, creatine's for. Creapure. Yeah, I don't. I don't. Know, I don't know. Like I don't know what you would yeah inject that straight energy substrate for, but. Yeah, no, I have. I actually don't know much about that. Mm. I, I think um, pretend. I, I don't. I, I, it's usually not the substrate itself because, like, let's think about like one example from bodybuilding. <laughs> it's um, like a potential. I'll go maybe. in on well, this shipping think, if you want. Think about like. Um, <laughs> think about like oh, how much do they cost? It's, <laughs> it's only sixty bucks. Oh, unless they're unless I'm missing something. No, no, yeah, it's, it's it much, says right? without. You just need the bacteriostatic water and the back it. water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You already got that in SEMA. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> don't 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 fuck up because I'm using that because I was using injectable L-carnitine. Don't start saying shit saying, to make people so think I'm you using can drugs. Save a little bit. You better chill. Yeah, yeah. I have some too. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, that's and this will be an interesting question. Uh, are you still considered natural if you do the fall statin gene therapy? 
that's the fucking thing, man. <laughs> that's what pisses me. Um, I'm. Yeah. I think so. I don't. I think so. I so think but so. at this as point, a, I'm natural, really starting not I still to call myself natural. <laughs> really? I mean, I haven't done that. All right, high five. <laughs> <laughs> You're a doctor. You know, at the end of the day, I only care about your opinion. Yeah, his his word is final. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. that clarification finally. <laughs> yeah, I, I almost think that if anything breaks the skin, then it's kind of like your your natty card's gone. Mm. That's how I feel. But oh. that's such a it's. But what's wrong with improving your health and longevity? Oh, there's like, nothing wrong with it. I'm all for it. I'm just saying, like, I mean, where, because everybody brings that up, like, oh, where in nature are you going to find X, Y, and Z? Yeah. It's like, well, you're not going to naturally, you know, make shit up and then, like, slice your skin open and throw it in there. Yeah. You're going to But natural bodybuilding it. and powerlifting has always been because of the anabolics that can significantly, like super physiological levels can significantly improve your muscle mass and strength, right? Yes. This stuff isn't doing that. Like if it's not altering, like then it's creopure, not natural, right? Like that improves performance. Yeah, I use creatine every yeah. day. Yeah. Ergogenic aid is uh, caffeine. Like that improves performance. I use caffeine every day. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Again, I said, if it breaks the skin, <laughs> if you were like cooking and then, and then injecting uh caffeine then i'd be like well that's that doesn't seem very natural to me yeah. <laughs> but then the iv vitamin drips that help with mm. uh, recovery and anti mm -hmm. like nad and nmn and, and, and nmn, NMN fda yeah. regular re recently said it's a drug so they banned it mm. which is crazy because you can order off amazon and dubai and every other country in the world yeah because <laughs> it works they had to ban it right yeah, so you know i don't know the f I, f I find as being in the natural community like yeah i was you know i was re i'm very intimately involved like i know alan aragon and eric helms uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah like, like yeah. i know all those guys like but I think they're outdated, unfortunately. You know, I think they have missed the boat. The medicine has evolved into a technology mm -hmm. where we can improve health and longevity, and which happens to improve performance. Does that make you not natural? No. To me, all it's doing is improving your ability to do what you love. I'm going to be able to bodybuild. What do you think? No. Okay. So, no. The, the reason why this is cool, and in, in my mind, no, in my mind, like there is conflicting shit going on. But at the end of the day. The reason why I never took steroids when mm -hmm. I was younger was because there is a stupid ass risk to it. There's mm -hmm. so many complexities that go into taking testosterone. Guys take testosterone. They don't know how to fuck to come off and they end up messing themselves up. I never wanted to have health issues. Mm -hmm. So I never used anything and it worked. Mm -hmm. But the things that he's currently talking about, no health issues mm -hmm. it, so far. I mean, hopefully it stays that way, but it just seems to be something that's going to help your longevity, help you live longer and help you perform for a longer amount of time. It's not going to take away from your health or your performance. So in my mind, I'm like, maybe that does take away my natty card. But at the same time, at this point, I don't know if I really care now. No. Exactly. <laughs> I don't my, know if I give a fuck. That was my revelation. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I care whatever weird standard that they have. Because I'd mm. want my mom to do this. Exactly. I'd, like I did it for both my parents. Why yeah. wouldn't I do it for them, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, to me, it's a no-brainer. And it's it has so many benefits. And peptides in general, just so you understand, they're very safe. Like, because they're naturally produced by your body, right? And so your body already knows recognizes a signal. Your All body also produces testosterone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's true. It's just the, the dosing, yeah. the dosing, right? It's all about dose. So yeah, I, I got to say like, just in my own experience, um, I've never really seen anyone, um, with any side effect that I, that I know of that I've, that I could see. And even for myself with peptides, I've never seen anybody have, I haven't either. The only I've one I've never I seen anything, um, I've never heard anybody say, man, I had to come off that. Like yeah. I got super sick. I never, I guess uh, there are certain ones that you could, uh, if you, you know, if you use too much, obviously something like insulin, you got to be really careful with that one. But uh, for the most part, I have never heard anybody report any bad news other than just like they thought it worked or they thought it didn't work. Exactly. So it's about safety and then it's about efficacy. We know it's safe. It has little to no harm. And it has potentially a lot of upside. So why not try it before a lot of pharmaceuticals? Because there's even peptides that can increase your dopamine and serotonin production now. And so you can use them as an alternative to like SSRIs and, you know, but again, like they're not going to take off because, I mean, they will take off within like our communities and social media and stuff like that, but they're not going to take off mainstream because they're not patentable. Mm. So, and because you can't patent it, you can't make a lot of money off of it. So they're not going to push it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the narrative that they're going to continue to follow. They made it clear that they do not care about people. They don't care about health. They care about profits. And I think we need to, like as a community, it's about us like raising awareness about what's out there so people can empower their own health. Like you have to really self-educate now um, because you can't trust your doctor, to be honest, because if you go to your average doctor, 
And I've had this happen many times. They'll tell you, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to go see Dr. Khan for stem cells. So the doctor will be like, what? Don't do mm. that. Like, you're crazy. You're going to die. You're going to get cancer. <laughs> like, please stop. Like, and then I'm, I'm like, and then I have to tell them, like, what is, like, what does your doctor even know about this stuff? Like, they don't even know anything. You can at least be honest and be like, hey, I don't know much. Mm. You know, maybe, maybe we don't have enough evidence. Talk to him. But like to say outward about something you're not expert in is like, it makes them look bad. And I just tell the patients, I'm like, look, there's this much evidence. I show them the research and then they're just like, okay, clearly my doctor doesn't know anything. <laughs> and and even with peptides, like most doctors have like no knowledge about it because it's not pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry that's pr uh, promoting it, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the medicine landscape is shifting and now we're going to be looking more at what's called real world evidence, which is like, does it actually work or not? And yeah. is it, you know, and that's what really most people care about. Like randomized control trials are great and they're always going to have a place. But if you have, if you have thousands or millions of data points because of patient registries and all the data of real world, isn't that more valuable than just some RCT with like a hundred people? Like mm -hmm. to me it is. And I think to a lot of clinical epidemi epidemiologists who are educated and not biased by pharmaceutical companies, they say the same thing. I've taught like one of my friends is an MD PhD on this uh, clinical epi and he he, you know, I've talked to him so much about this and he, he admits it. He's like, you know, pharmaceutical companies, like even with like PCSK9 inhibitors, which, you know, I think um, Peter Tia promotes a lot. Like a lot of that is like statistical fuckery that they do just to get a magnitude of result that they want because there, there's different types of risk reduction. There's something called relative risk reduction versus absolute risk reduction. And by the way, what do PCSK9 inhibitors do? Oh, they uh, lower cholesterol. Okay. So they're basically like an alternative to a statin, yeah. uh, but they they don't cause the side effects like a lot of statins do. So they've been getting a lot of attract, like you know, a lot of um, press about them. But the actual magnitude of effect is questionable. What that means is like, how many people do you actually need to treat to actually save their life, like decrease the risk of dying? And that's called number needed to treat versus what's called number needed to harm. How many people are going to get harmed by this intervention? And the number needed to treat for a lot of these chronic disease drugs is actually very poor. It's like statins is like one in like two hundred. So people think in their mind, they're like, Whoa. oh, I'm taking a statin, yeah. therefore I'm going to reduce my risk of dying. But it's not, the number needed to treat is not that high. So when you look at the actual evidence, then you realize, you're like, wait a minute, most of these drugs don't even do much. Mm. <laughs> and they have risk. And there's a better alternative. So then it's just like, you know, it, it's like checkmate, you know, like they're going to, it's going to sooner or later, it's going to, the stuff is going to keep taking off. And um, there's a reason why I think like all the biggest uh, venture capital, private equity groups in the world are all, all investing into health and longevity now. Yeah, They're, as you mentioned, I don't think you've mentioned some of your investors are like Thiel Capital. Like he's, you know, he, Thiel Capital is the guy who made PayPal, Peter Thiel, and mm -hmm. um, and then you know Sam Altman, the Chat GPD guys, also backed our company, Mini Circle, and um, and then we have private equity groups from um, Asia and Europe that are backing uh, my company, Eterna. So. We got a lot of well-known people and like you need those people because, yeah. you know, you need protection. And there's good, if, when you're disrupting <laughs> an industry, you're going to have a lot of people coming after you. Um, and my, you know, I think medicine needs disruption because it's overdue. So you have a hot date coming up and you look in your closet and all you see are the old ugly clothes that you usually wear and you're going to wear tonight. <laughs> it's time to end that, guys. That's why we've partnered with Viore Clothing because they have some amazing athleisure clothes that you can wear in the gym when working out, but also clothes that you can wear on a date or during Hanukkah, or whatever. <laughs> you can wear these clothes wherever, and they feel amazing. Some of our favorites are the Ponter Performance line, which has Dreamnet fabric, which literally feels so soft on your skin. But they also have this. This is the Rise Tee, also soft, also feels nice and fits great. And they have a lot of amazing clothes that you need to check out to step your fashion game up. We're trying to help you out. Andrew, where can they get it? Yeah, absolutely. You guys got to head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V U O R I.com slash power project, and you'll automatically receive 20% off your order. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Let's see if you can bring up that clip I sent you, Andrew. I sent you a clip of uh, Dana White kind of talking about uh, not, oh. not wanting to go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. So I'm actually treating his uh, trainer, uh, Milos. So I'm hoping I'm going to be able to treat uh, Dana. I'd love uh, to. Can you I, text it to me, Mark? Because it, it didn't oh, come through on the I, email. Oh, yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to help, like you know, people like that because, um, and a lot of my patients say this. They're like, "You're the only doctor I'll go to because they they trust me and they they and I'm like real. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm not I'm not trying to and we, and because I'm also a gym bro. So that mm -hmm. helps. <laughs> I think I think one of the reasons why like it, it's really dope is because like you're not purely attacking this like most biohackers do. When I hear biohackers talk about a lot of stuff, it's purely use this pill, use this 
red light therapy, even though red light therapy is great. I have a device <laughs> yeah. at home. I use it almost every single day. But they only talk <laughs> about these things, whereas you've talked about lifestyle, nutrition, all these things that sleep, all these things that people should fucking be doing already. That's going to move the needle in a huge way, along with all these things stacked on top. It's going to make you superhuman. It's exactly. It, but not many people think that way. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a foundation. Once you have the foundation covered with like all the like lifestyle stuff, then it's like, what's next? And this is what's next: is cell and gene therapy and all the anti aging stuff. Now, let's see what you think of this. Never talk to a doctor about my general health ever again. If I break my arm, I'm going to go see a doctor. Right. If I need surgery, I'm going to go see a doctor. My general health, never again. <laughs> None of them know okay, what they're talking down. about. They're all full of shit. All they it. know is to put you on pills mm -hmm. and put you on medicine. That's all they know. He had all of these conditions. I've been talking to doctors. None of them could fix any of my problems. I said, I'm surprised yeah. you can even Yeah. So that's Gary Brecka. He, uh, he's an interesting guy. but uh -huh. <laughs> <Interesting>. <laughs> A lot of people did have a lot to say about that. Well, uh, Gary, I mean, I can tell you, like, you know, he's... He, one of my patients went to him and he wasn't very happy because he, you know, he charges 10,000 just to like get a blood work review and he's mm. not even a medical doctor. But mm. I'm not saying he's not helpful, but I'm just saying like a lot of these guys, I think, um, you know, they over, they are overselling themselves because they get a little bit of fame and I think they right. just start gouging people and start mm -hmm. saying that they can do the whole amazing things when they can't because uh, they don't even have the best technology. We do. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then uh, number two, he is right in that most doctors are focused and it's, it's, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Mm. You guys know that? The, I think it's like you're smarter than you think you are or whatever, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, and that, and doctors, because especially in like a lot of like Ivy League doctors and even in Ontario where I come from, like to get into an Ontario med school is the equivalent of getting into like an Ivy League school. So you have to like have almost perfect GPA, like high scores, all that stuff. And then so, and then once you're selected, they basically tell you you're like a god. You're like, you know, you're cream of the crop. You're the best of society, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And so you're told from like, basically you're indoctrinated in a system where you're institutionalized and told that you're the best at what in the world for whatever. And then, so you think that everything you're learning is from the best people. And then you also think what you know is must be the best. Yeah. And so you never question it. And so you go through this whole process of being like, I must know everything because I'm a doctor and I went to this med school and I did this training. How can anyone possibly know more than me? And so this is where the God complex comes from because so many doctors have that, right? They're, they think they know everything. Um, and you know, for me, it was always just like, I was always the opposite. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm dumb as shit. I just got lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, I just feel like I got lucky for where I am. Like, you know, I never thought I was that smart. I just was a hard worker and I just, you know, and obviously because I was a hard worker and I never viewed myself as smarter than anyone, I just always kept learning. And so, because I kept learning, that's what's just, that's what been the main difference between me and everyone else. And I think if I had a conversation with Dana, he would be very, he'd have a, hopefully a very different perspective because I lift. I've deadlifted 600 pounds. Like I'm pretty strong. Like I, Yo. you know, I'm into work. Like I love working out and like I've, I've been doing, optimizing my sleep and nutrition, all that stuff for years. I know like Alan, I follow his stuff, like Aragon, he's probably, mm -hmm. like, you know, he's probably the best nutrition resource out there. And there's so many other people I follow to like learn about this stuff and stay on the cutting edge of like supplements, nutrition, all that. Yeah. Um, so I know the lifestyle stuff in and out and I practice it myself. But on top of that, I also happen to be a doctor and I happen to do cutting edge innovative therapies. So I can give a unique perspective that a lot of doctors can't because Dana is, he's saying the same thing. Like, um, I don't know if you guys know Dan Brazilian. He, yeah, 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 yeah. Like that guy says the same stuff as him. He's basically like, I don't trust doctors. They're all drug pushers, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Which is like, it, it, I'm not saying like most doctors are, but there are some of us who aren't. And we're actually generally trying to do what's best for our people. And even the doctors who are drug pushers, it's not necessarily they don't care. They want to get people better. It's but, not nefarious. Yeah, it's not nefarious. Yeah. They're just, they don't know what they don't know. And so, and that's just a problem, right? Like they, they're just educated in that system and that's what they've been told. And so they just continue to follow that because most doctors are doing a job. They're not necessarily interested in like, you know, changing the world. <laughs> if you really listen to the words that Dana White said, you know, he said, I, I, you know, went to everybody and nobody could fix me. And I think like that's really important to understand. Uh, the only person that can fix anything is going to be yourself, doesn't matter what treatment you get. Even if we go and get some of your uh, stuff done, that's going to be helpful. But now I have to treat myself well 
in order to like, you know, still stay around. So I think mm-hmm. people tend to get very frustrated, uh, which is understandable because you might go from one doctor to another and you might hear difference of opinion. Like, I don't know why that guy uh, told you to exercise. Your blood pressure is way too high. Then you go to the other guy and he's like, man, well, you should really ride your bike and you should get out and do some cardio and and you hear from somebody else that you should lift weights or whatever the things are. Maybe somebody just sends you off with some pills, uh, you know, metformin or something like that and try to manage your blood sugar and your blood pressure or something along those lines. And so it's understandable that people get frustrated, but, you know, Dana White years ago and along with just our general population don't do a good job of managing our health. We don't do a good job of staying connected to uh, walking, eating properly, getting good rest, Um, Even just something as simple as like studying uh, how to not get yourself so stressed can be like one of the strongest, most powerful moves you can ever make because that's really what each day is about. It's like, what are you going to be able to handle, not just now and today, but in the future? Yeah, no, and that's exactly our slogan is empowering the body's natural healing abilities. That's literally what we do is because your body has what it needs to heal. We're just giving it the signals and the tools it needs mm. so it can do it. And we're trying to build more resiliency in your body because at the end of the day, like, you know, with the food and the t- pollutants and everything in the environment, people are still going to get exposed to a lot of crap. Mm. And so you have to basically give the body the ability to deal with whether it's actual toxin stressor, stressors or like even mental stressors, right? And that's where the interventional stuff comes in, like the vagus nerve, the even the stem cells, they strengthen your immune system. They help your body to deal with things better. So we're trying to give you resiliency. So whatever you know you deal with, at least you have a better buffer to deal with it. And that buffer is improved the most by lifestyle. But is there things that we can do to add on to that? And that's what we're trying to do. Let me ask you this. Um, what is the future you envision? Like maybe the 10 year scope. Yeah. 10 years from now. <laughs> what, what what do you what is your ideal? Yeah, no, for me, it would be um, pers- personalized, 3D bioprinted, tissue engineered stem cells customized for everyone for their problem. Mm-hmm. So basically that way you, you know, you have your whatever, let's say you have a cartilage defect or you have a pathway in your body that Small we can- Small wrists. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a medical problem. <laughs> me. He's just walking around. His like, wrist is like the size of a boxing glove. <laughs> but no, what I, what I see is personal, basically personalized cell therapy. So essentially, we, we figure out what the problem in your body is, and then we can make a customized gene-edited cell therapy that is embedded with those hydrogels I was talking about, so it's protected, and and we can inject it or in, in, implant it or whatever to fix the pathway or the problem. And so we're actually going to be doing this. We're, we, I was just talking with my scientists, um, and we're, we're going to be doing this with kidney patients. We're injecting stem cells into the kidneys directly. For we have a lot of like bodybuilders stuff like that who have kidney disease. And like I did it for do you guys know Fuad? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we did we did just the IV for him and improved his uh, eGFR by ten, which is really significant. Um, and and he's 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 been stable or declining for the last like five years. So and that was just IV. So now we're going to do the actual injection for him. But what we're going to do is we're working on a product called we have Clotho Gene Therapy. That's our next yeah. product. So Clotho is a peptide. It's again it's been around for a while. It 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 can protect your body from kidney dysfunction. It helps to heal the kidneys. It also has neurodegenerative uh, anti neurodegenerative properties. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to create gene edited cells that have the Clotho in the stem cells, and then we're going to inject those directly into the kidneys. And then our theory is that we will be able to actually reverse kidney disease completely. So hopefully we can take people from stage four to like stage two, stage one. Yeah. Wow. Damn, that's insane. But then, you know, if we do that, <laughs> the house, like, you know, there's going to be so much, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of, you know, uh, people coming after us. Right. The, and I think if you Google mini circle or company, there's already a negative press around it. So it's like, there's going to be a lot of um, people who are going to say things, but you know, the, the results are in the pudding, right? So we'll, we'll show those real world results and you can't really argue with it. The, is on, oh, but on your website, I'm just, cause I want us to be able to put this in the description. You've mentioned a lot of studies and research you guys are doing. Is there anything where people can maybe keep track of what you guys are doing or they can look at it for themselves? Cause yeah, I mean, our, our website, eterna.health, we're posting all the research on there as it comes out. And so we're, we have a database there that we're building out. And then, I mean, my Instagram too, I do <laughs> I yeah. do a good job of, I try to put everything on there and try to, you know, the latest research and showing what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but the database that we're going to have on our website is probably the best resource. Yeah, that's our website. And um, we're, we're working on, I have a team working on a research database. We have a blog and then we have like a, 
all the different research that we're going to be posting and like for because basically we have different sections we're going to have different sections like you know for degenerative disc disease osteoarthritis for infertility for autism for blah 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 so we'll have oh, all like man. the de- all, we're working on that right now yeah what are you working on for infertility uh, well, so we have a, the biochemist that we have, the nutritionist, she has a protocol using lifestyle, like first, if that doesn't mm-hmm. work with like, she has a whole protocol using supplements, lifestyle, because a lot of times it's stress, it's lifestyle stuff. That's the reason they can't get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that doesn't work with her, then we actually do IV stem cells or in- injections directly into the ovaries to improve the f- health of the follicles. Mm. So, that's but again, like it, it, you, but the industry is already established, right? With IVF, and mm-hmm. it, you, if you're disrupting that industry, you're going to be, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then just the gene therapy, we're going to work on too for that. Mm. Are you taking any like actual like security measures for yourself? Because, <laughs> dude, like, well, I mean, because like, or you know, urban legends, whatever you want to call it, but like the the first dude that created like a uh, like a, a a car that can run on water, like yeah. you just disappear out of nowhere, <laughs> and so it's like I don't, know, I'm just like how how like you you said that you guys were like being secure with everything so like i just wanted to make sure that like you are really really are thinking of everything <laughs> yeah no i've uh, after talking to dave asprey he, his advice was i should hire he should you know we should probably have someone like that yeah i'll probably hire big do you guys know big mike mike van wick the guy Let's with the skull, skull tattoo yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he some... was uh he was drake's bodyguard before nice. so now yeah. he he trains on he just he because his brand built up so he just does training now but I was like, uh, he's my patient. So I was like, bro, I, yeah. maybe I'll hire him. <laughs> I mean, let me give you, I mean, your parents probably gave you this advice too, but this is advice my mom and grandma always told me. Do not eat other people's food. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, don't. <laughs> that shit, be careful. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but when the food is poison and it's corrupt, man, you got someone's got to do something. Um, you can't just watch the system destroy itself. And it is like, like look at uh, America, right? It's it, the America spends more on GDP per capita on health than any, like any country in the world. And like, they're spending so much money because of chronic disease and if we don't change the system it's going to implode it on itself and like there's so many like you know and i was in new york a couple weeks ago and i was just like like literally there's like people just seem so on edge like there was like a guy driving and the other person was going slow and she was like literally going to crash into him just because he was going slow like it was crazy (laughs) and like anger (laughs) (laughs) like i'm like just chill man why are people so angry (laughs) like so i feel like there's a lot of that and like a lot of the technology we have i think can help like I was saying, to build that buffer and that resiliency so people can deal with all the shit that's going on. Yeah. And then at least then it can empower them to do the lifestyle stuff, right? And we're, I think most people know they need to exercise, they need to eat, they need to do all the basics. Like most people know about that now, but it's like, how do we actually move the needle so that they can sustain it? And that's, I think that's the only way really I, th- I see is like this stuff because it actually reprograms your mind and your body. Uh, what do you uh, do for exercise at the moment? Well, right now I'm like a gym bro, so basically a four, five day a five day split. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, I've been uh, I'm I'm Pakistani, so I don't know if uh, Pakistanis uh, we probably have some some of the worst genetics when it comes to bodybuilding, but mm. I do love I do love lifting and uh, you know as a as a 130 pound guy before who was like stick skinny, like mm-hmm. I I've, I'm pretty proud of what I've been able to do with lifting. Yeah. I, I usually I was training with um, do you guys know Bryce Lewis? Of yeah, yeah, the powerlifter. So, yeah, yeah. So he used to co- his team used to coach me. Um, Strength so was, athlete, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, nice. Because they only coach natural. They only coach natural people. So I was like, yeah. I like these guys. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so I do. I I was doing powerlifting for a few years, and I got my you know I hit I hit pretty decent numbers, and so now I've been doing bodybuilding because I just want to do. I think you just did a. Body, did you do a bodybuilding contest? I did a bodybuilding show a while back. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I want to get that, you know, shredded look and then just mm-hmm. do my, maybe do a photo thing and then go back to powerlifting. Yeah. My goal is to squat 500. I've done like 430 before, but awesome. So, but I'd love to hit 500 before I, you know, I, I, I you know, now with everything though, I feel like I can keep lifting till I'm like 60, 70, mm-hmm. I think, like heavy. Yeah. I'm pretty confident, like based off what I have access to mm-hmm. and the way I feel. Like I feel better now than I did when I was like 22. Nice. You know what I mean? So, like, what what's stopping me from like lifting you know yeah there's um 100 and i've done 125 dumbbells Mm -hmm. so that's been my pr for that for four reps what about the other uh doctors and the other people you work with you try to encourage them to exercise and stuff too or are they already on it they don't know it's it's so funny because i've met some of the smartest doctors in the world like there's this one intensivist i remember like an icu doctor he's a brilliant guy and 
he's doing like a 1980s like Arnold Schwarzenegger split. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, there's better ways to work out. <laughs> and so I'm just, I'm like, ba- I'm like baffled sometimes. I'm like, they're so smart, but they don't even know how to train. Mm. And they, they think they just, I don't know what they read. They must still be reading the old, lit- like the old, they're just following the biggest guy in the gym, I guess. Because like you and I both know like strength, like what's that book? Uh, super training? Super training. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that By was Mel like, Sif, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like that book was legendary. Right. And like it gives you, so, and then I read Pollock's books too. And like those, they give you such a good framework for how to actually design and periodize and stuff. Right. Yeah. And like, it's, it's just funny when I, and when I see these highly intelligent people who don't even know how to train properly, they train like a 1980s bodybuilder <laughs> and like, that's not the best way to train at all. Like if you got to do power, you got to do, you got to do like, um, not necessarily like DUP, but like you got to do some sort of like. You bring Rex and wow, this is not <laughs> very daily <laughs> periodization. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. but I, think, I think you got to do some sort of like periodization between strength and hypertrophy and metabolic training, right? And yeah. that's what I believe, and that's what I do personally. Like if I like to, uh, lifting heavy is not easy. Like it's a different neurological adaptation mm-hmm. than doing eight to twelve reps. And like you got to, I think you you need both for optimal health and longevity. And like unfortunately, a lot of these doctors are like, you know, they're just whatever they, they don't want to push themselves let's just say so they don't want to work hard in the gym and they don't they don't lift heavy if you don't like ronnie coleman said it back best and this is a uh, adaptation to his quote <laughs> every every <laughs> everyone wants to be a health guru but no one wants to lift heavy ass weights <laughs> oh, oh 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 that's true that's fucking true especially Very now true. it's so annoying like everyone wants to be a freaking health guru longevity expert and they don't even they freaking can't lift more than like their body weight like it's like what are you doing bro like, so, like lift some heavy weights then come back and maybe we'll have a conversation like I, it's, it's frustrating because like to me it's like well, they don't even understand the some foundation some of the guys that are talking about it a lot now it kind of seems like they just started picking up weights more recently <laughs> <laughs> you can like, tell by the 12 inch arms <laughs> oh I don't like, want to cool skinny shame found it long time you know <laughs> So I'm, I, I, I think it's, uh, and that's one of the things I like about, you know, I think one of the, my pieces of advice to people who want to, you know, do whatever they want to do is it's called cross pollination, like being in one industry and learning from them and then applying it to a different industry. And that's kind of what I did with bodybuilding and fitness and powerlifting to medicine. Like, so I just always had a different perspective on like how to view medicine because I was, I was, I loved bodybuilding, mm-hmm. you know, and that, that just gives you a different perspective. If you only are in one industry your whole life, you're you're closing yourself off to so many other things, right? And you don't you may never see things differently. Yeah. You mentioned uh, how fast everything's moving. How do you stay up on stuff uh, with having a practice, with uh, getting on some podcasts, and just all the other things that you're doing, your own exercising and stuff like that? Yeah, and I mean, I I travel and work around the world too, so it's it's a lot. But I'm reading, you know probably like 20, 30 hours a week, just any time in between. I don't watch TV. I don't watch, you know, <laughs> basically I, I'm not like, I guess I'm kind of like a robot in a sense, but I'm just obsessed with this stuff. You and write articles and stuff too. Yeah. And I have, um, you know, I also have a good team around me now with, you know, researchers and stuff like that. And I'm always, I have Google Scholar alerts. So basically I go back to the source, which is uh, essentially like the primary literature. Yeah. And so that's what I'm reading on a, you know, weekly basis. Cause, mm. and then I listen the I listen to a podcast called the stem cell podcast and, the immunobiology podcasts are like super, super boring and dense, but they're, <laughs> but they're, 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 those guys are like scientists, right? They're basic scientists. And I, that's where I learn a lot of my stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I can come on your guys' podcasts and like other big podcasts and share it with the world, you know, because those scientists are never going to, you know, they're, they're just very like, you know, uh, mundane. <laughs> so my, my, my whole passion is like clinical, what's called clinical translation. Yeah. It's like, how do we take what we know is out there on the science, basic research science side and let the world know about it? Because mm-hmm. all the stuff I've spoken about is like backed by science. It's not like I'm just making it up. You know what I mean? And so it's just like, but a lot of people aren't aware about it. And so there's a, there's a big gap. It's some, some people say it's between 15 to 20 years in terms of when the research is actually published to when clinical implementation actually happens. Mm. So it's just, it's just a massive gap. And like we got to, tr- my job is trying to f- close that gap. Yeah. You had a theory actually, um, rewinding a little bit to one rep maxes. Uh, you and Mark were actually talking about that. Can you let us know what you well, think? Well, tell them like- about, do people know about the Andy Gaplin thing you did? The Rhino? Oh, the Rhino mm-hmm. study? Yeah. Um, I'll just try to describe it quickly. Uh, uh, Andy, uh, years ago, t- Andy Galpin took uh, a muscle biopsy out of my leg. And then he I don't know, did some testing on it and he compared it to that of a, a rhinoceros. And uh, my muscle fibers, I think, were more dense. They were thicker than the rhino. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So 
there's two things. One, one thing we know about health and longevity, there's something called myosteatosis. That's how much fat goes into your muscle. So if you have a lot of fat infiltration in your glutes and your rec fem, specific because the glutes are the biggest muscle in the body, mm-hmm. that's actually a predictor of longevity and like poor outcomes with like COVID. So, so the muscle fibers, the density you have is very protective for your health, mm-hmm. right? And so if people can have that type of muscle density, that's going to be very protective. But then the other aspect of it is I, I have a theory that the neurological drive and the signaling pathways that get activated when you do a one rep max is going to be completely different from like building dense muscle because that's like more hypertrophy training. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be very interesting for us to see, and we we should do this, is basically we get get a bunch of powerlifters and maybe we have them do one rep max and three rep max and then we do like blood samples and we look at the different signaling pathways that get activated. And then we can see our anti-aging and longevity pathways being activated because we know what those pathways are now. So we can look at like, you know, nuclear factor, kappa B pathway, like MAP, K, MAP, Okay, like all these different pathways and see, are these actually being activated or what kind of signaling effects is one rep max training having on your body? Because I believe, I think there's something special about a one rep max, like mm-hmm. in terms of how it, what it does to your body, even the high you feel afterwards, it's, it's different, right? And it's like, unless you've done it, you, you don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, m- I remember we had uh, the uh, back doctor on, what's the uh, guy's name? Stuart McGill. Stuart McGill. Oh yeah, Stu, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Stuart McGill. And he was talking about, you know, how, strength training, you know, works your central nervous system, you know, and it, it kind of taps into something that maybe, you know, bodybuilding doesn't quite get. Obviously you're going to tap into your nervous system whenever you're doing just about anything. Um, but the, those one rep maxes, those three rep maxes, those, those, uh, reps that you have to really pay attention to your form and your technique on, I think, uh, do have a lot of utility. And I do think that they're really powerful in terms of, um, just keeping someone sharp and keeping somebody uh, young. But at the same time, I think you need to be a little careful with them because they can make you very old very quickly because you can move around and walk around for days afterwards like you're really old. And then if you can't get your gait back and you can't get your walk back in the way that you normally would move back, um, you're going to be kind of hobbling around even long after you're no i, I believe that, that heavy i believe you have to have a trained professional to coach you like yeah. even i i mean i know a decent amount about lifting mm-hmm. but I, even i had a coach right like i think most people need a trained professional who knows how to do proper periodization when it comes to powerlifting because like, you need you need some points of backing off exactly and, and getting away from yeah, it. yeah exactly you're gonna get that's i mean i wouldn't be so busy with injuries if people knew how to train <laughs> so yeah. it's just people a lot of people don't know how to train and they just get hurt and mm. um th- but i think the neurological adaptations that you get from that are very unique and i think even we're learning now there's something called exerkines and myokines which are um, basically cytokines that are released in response to exercise and and released to and released from the muscle as well they're called myokines mm-hmm. so cytokines are just like you probably heard of cytokine storm like during covid yeah. and stuff mm-hmm. they're basically a protein right that sends a signal and that signal can be to reduce inflammation or promote inflammation and so exerkines and myokines help reduce inflammation they protect your body from cancer from diabetes they go into the brain they help with neurogenesis so there's all these amazing benefits that we know at a cellular level are happening because of exercise yeah. and because and now we know how they're mediated it's because of this they're called the, the cytokines basically mm. and so it'd be it'd, it'd be cool to measure you know with the one rep max are the exerkines and the myokines that you're getting are they different than like you know the traditional training I bet they would be yeah it'd be great as we move forward to hear more information about like what sprinting does or what uh, you know jogging does on your jeans or lifting or jujitsu like it'd be it's just so cool to know what are some of the actual things that are being, you know, produced in some of those moments? Yeah, no, it's it's actually a whole field. It's called spatial transcriptomics. It's a whole spe- it's a whole scientific field that looks at single cell imaging resolution. So basically, you can see down to like a single cell now, mm-hmm. and you can see how it's working and what it's doing. Like jujitsu is fascinating to me because it's you're you're solving like yeah. a problem. You're solving. Exactly. You know, it seems like you're. Uh, to me, it seems like you're like putting together a piece of a puzzle or something like that. It is a puzzle. Especially yeah. when you're not thinking about it, yeah. when like you have two good grapplers that aren't thinking about what's going on, but they're responding to everything that the other yeah. grapplers doing in real time, right? So what's so. that doing in your brain? Like it's <laughs> got to be amazing, you know? Exactly. Yeah, I think the neuroprotective benefits of that are massive, mm. and uh, I, I mean, the, by far the number one way to protect your body from dementia is resistance training. Mm. Like that goes hands down because of the myokines and the extra kinds that you get from that that produce neuroinflammation and yeah. stimulate neurogenesis. It's because and. But again, not many people want to lift heavy ass weights. <laughs> it's not easy, right? Are there any other bodybuilders that you're aware of? You mentioned uh, Chris Bumstead. Are there any other bodybuilders that are that have utilized some of your 
or uh, Reagan lifters. Grimes. Yeah, mm. oh, we yeah. used it for him. Yeah, and then um, Ed Cohn. Mm. I, we talked about, I think, and uh, I've uh, worked with Jeremy Hamilton as well. And um, I think Reagan just is going to connect me with Brian Shaw. So I'm hoping mm. you help him out. Of that. I was cool. just thinking, if you get like <laughs> some of these strong men or big power lifters, yeah, I think like, Shaw retired, right? Yeah. But I, I think wonder he, if he wants to come back. To come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure even if he doesn't want to come back, he wants to feel and look yeah, or feel yeah, younger, right? Everyone who doesn't want to feel younger, right? Yeah. And like it, it's if we can do that in a meaningful way, then it's it's it improves your quality of life, right? And just makes you feel good. Have you had any uh, pro athletes that uh, you know come off injury and then they they're now back in? Oh yeah, know, so many. I, I treat I work well. with many NHL, NFL, NBA guys. Um, I can't say names because of confidentiality mm. reasons, but. Uh, I've treated some of the top athletes in the world. Like um, we're talking like top five NFL, top awesome. five NHL. Yeah. And um, so we can just kind of guess. Like, Google <laughs> top five be like, this. one of these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, uh, it, the, I, I, like I said, my original was sports medicine, interventional pain. And the reason people come to us is because we're able to find things on image guidance and like direct the injections right into it. Cause like a sports, like I had an NFL quarterback, um, he, you know, he makes like 40 million a year and he, uh, he had an elbow injury. And they told him basically the only way is to get surgery. And they helped to take him out for the whole freaking season, right? He had a tear in his uh, ligament and his tendon. So we, we found it with ultrasound. And he also had a tain, uh, tear in his pronator. Um, but we, so we found it with ultrasound and we just guided it and we did stem cells and fixed it all up. And then he was, fit, he was good in like six weeks mm -hmm. and avoid, avoids putting a whole season, right? This is insanity. Yeah. It really it is. Just <laughs> launched us into the future. <laughs> Yo. The problem is the team doctors are all orthopedic uh, surgeons. So everyone thinks, oh, what's... you're a team doctor for Miami Heat. You must be an amazing doctor. <laughs> Actually, they're they're not that great. <laughs> they're like average doctors. They just mm -hmm. know what's textbook. And they're good surgeons. I must say they're amazing surgeons. They can cut. They can do all that. But they don't know how to inject. They don't know anything about regenerative medicine. They definitely don't know anything about gene therapy. And so they're just like very outdated. And so, and like we're talking about, the medical literature is expanding so fast. How can you expect an orthopedic surgeon to stay on top of this? Mm -hmm. I'm like a specialist in this field. This is all I do is sell in gene therapy stuff. And so I, I, it's my job to stay on top of this. But for them, their job is to cut at people and, mm. you know, and it's just a different skill set. And so it's unfortunate because for whatever reason, all the professional sports teams have decided that orthopedic surgeons are the best people to have as their team doctors, mm -hmm. which they might be if you have a fracture or you have like, you know, like a really bad tear that needs surgery, but most injuries aren't like that. Most injuries can be repaired non-surgically. Yeah. And that's the reality of it. And so a lot of them have to sneak around and see me and they can't mm. tell their team. Mm. Dude, this is so exciting. Like not just for everybody, like the general population of people. Mainly for us. Yeah. <laughs> but but the, <laughs> Don't like, release us. <laughs> <laughs> no, any people that like, anybody who loves sports and, and, and is an athlete themselves, college athletes, kids, like people get injured and then they're, they're out for their sport forever. Yeah. yeah. Like that's their life and I, it's gone. Man, I've saved things, so many careers. Like yeah. it's been amazing. Like, yeah, especially young kids. Like I feel, <sighs> man, I've had, yeah, no, it's, it's obviously for them. It's different, right? When you're treating a person with, you know, they can't play tennis with their friends. Like it's nice to get them back, but to save someone's career and livelihood is a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's really meaningful that way. And, but also people like same thing with chronic pain. A lot of chronic pain patients are actually depressed, suicidal, because they're, you know, they've been living with chronic pain for years and getting them out of chronic pain just gives back their life. And you, a lot of patients have told me I've, they've, I've saved their life because I'm not saving their life in like the hospital like type of setting, but it's different. Um, you know, you're giving back their, you're giving back their life. Mm. Yeah, we're going to get my brother over to your spot because uh, he's had chronic pain forever. So uh, if you could help him, I think you could help anybody mm -hmm. else in the whole, whole entire planet. Yeah, no, he's exactly. Been he's suffering he, for a long time. He's Yeah, and I think it'll be great to help him and, uh, and he said he's doing a documentary too, right? So yeah. that'll be amazing. I think it's good to raise awareness as much as possible on all this. Um, I actually just tried, cr uh, interesting. <laughs> I, tried, I tried something called uh, Kratom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I heard you're a big fan of it. It's actually pretty, it's pretty cool. And it can help with like, I was reading about it. It can help with chronic pain as well. Yeah. Um, for because it's an opioid receptor agonist. I'll give you some on your way out. <laughs> yeah, we have some here. I should have had some before the show. There you go. <laughs> strength is never a weakness. Weak is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. Guys, my mind is still currently blown. I'm twitching, <laughs> which is why I think you should check out Andy Triana because we did a podcast with him. He was mentioned during this podcast. He's also another guy who's going to blow your mind with all the things he talked about on that episode. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say right now other than... You're welcome. <laughs>